Good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 26th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. If you've not already done so, can I remind you to switch off all your mobile devices as they do affect the broadcasting system. <clears throat> I've received apologies from Gordon MacDonald today and Gil Patterson is attending as committee substitute. Agenda item one is items in private. The first item is to seek the agreement of the committee to take items four and five in private. Item four is to consider the evidence taken earlier on draft budget scrutiny, 2015-16. And item five is to consider the committee's approach to the freight transport inquiry. Are members agreed? Are agreed. Thank you. The second item of business today is to hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities on draft budget scrutiny 2015-16. So today, can I welcome Nicola Sturgeon, Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities, Sharon Fairweather, Director of Finance of Transport Scotland, Dominic Munro, Deputy Director, Housing and Sustainability and Innovative Finance, and Scott Mackay, Infrastructure Investment Unit of the Scottish Government. Can I welcome you all? Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make an opening statement? Thanks very much, Convener, and thanks to the committee for the invitation to be here. Um, as, as we see uh, private sector investment uh, start to recover and economic growth strengthen, uh, the role of the Scottish Government moves very firmly towards supporting strategic investments that underpin improvements in productivity, growth uh, and well-being over the, the long term, and that includes investments in transport schools and digital infrastructure. We're also investing in affordable housing, energy efficiency and health facilities to help address the challenge of poverty and inequality to improve uh, well-being for some of the most disadvantaged people and places in the country. So that uh, objective or those objectives underpin uh, the spending plans that I'm about to quickly run through. Uh, firstly, looking at our capital investment programme, uh, they are very focused on sustaining the economic recovery. Uh, we will deliver more than £8 billion of investment over 2014-15 and 2015-16. That will support around 40,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, and that, of course, is despite uh, some significant cuts to our capital uh, budgets uh, to help address uh, and compensate for those cuts, we're extending our revenue-funded investment through the NPD programme by £1 billion, taking that programme to £3.5 billion in total. Uh, out of that additional £1 billion, we are investing more than £300 million in schools for the future, £400 million of additional health investment and two new college campus developments. Uh, we also continue to directly support infrastructure spending through switching from resource to capital, utilising capital receipts and through the regulatory asset base real enhancements. Uh, and we do all of that uh, while continuing to maintain the commitment we have to allocate no more than 5% of our future Dell budget on the cost of revenue funded investment. Our annual progress report on the infrastructure investment plan showed that in 2013, 24 infrastructure projects worth 625 million completed construction uh, and we are making good progress in delivering the NPD investment programme with almost £650 million pounds worth of projects beginning construction in 2013-14 alone. Uh, so we continue to make excellent progress in taking forward our key investments Queensferry Crossing is on programme to be delivered in 2016. We've secured a further £50 million pounds of savings, taking the total reduction to the cost estimate to £195 million. Work progresses towards completion, again, on time and on budget of the New South Glasgow's hospital project. Schools for the Future programme uh, further expands, as I've just said, through the NPD extension, will now deliver over 100 newer refurbished schools by 2019 at 20, at 17 of them are already complete and operational. And lastly, construction is underway to deliver significant improvements to the M8, M73 and M74. And turn briefly, uh, convener, to housing. Uh, the budget enables us to deliver on our commitment to provide at least 30,000 new affordable homes over the life of the Parliament. Uh, since the publication of draft budget 2014-15, the budget for housing, regeneration and welfare has been 
augmented to reflect deployment of additional funding of £200 million. That includes additional loans and equity funding of £160 million to support the housing sector and additional resources for regeneration and affordable housing. We have also, in the draft budget, included £35 million for uh, discretionary housing payments uh, in order that local authorities can mitigate the impact of the bedroom tax in 2015-16. Uh, turning uh, quickly to transport, ongoing investment in transport obviously connects regions and people to economic opportunity, so it is vitally important in uh, contributing to national social cohesion and reducing inequality between different parts of Scotland. An investment in the transport infrastructure, such as the Queen's Ferry Crossing or the duelling of the A9 between Perth and Inverness, plays a key role in creating the best possible conditions for business success. Uh, as I have mentioned, a cumulative total of £195 million worth of savings has been released from the fourth replacement crossing project since construction started. Um, that means that the five-mile stretch of carriageway between Kincraig and Dalradi on the A9 will be the first of the 12 duelling schemes to be brought forward and is due to be completed in 2017, which is six months earlier than anticipated. We have also increased our plans for expenditure in air and ferry services, uh, recognising the importance of them and reflecting the acquisition of Presswick Airport, which we will come on to talk about uh, later on. We are also increasing our expenditure on support for sustainable and active travel by a further £10 million to £25 million. Uh, we have now invested over £84 million in active travel since 2011, as well as publishing our plan to replace petrol and diesel vehicles with electric vehicles by 2050, backed by over £14 million of investment until March 2016. Uh, in contrast to that, we have been able to reduce the budgets for rail franchise and rail infrastructure to reflect the efficiencies that have been secured through the new franchise franchises, uh, which also have, uh, of course, secured improvements to services. Uh, and finally, you'll be happy to know, uh, convener, just uh, to touch briefly on Scottish water. Uh, at the end of September, I wrote to the committee to inform you that I had agreed Scottish water's investment priorities for the next regulatory period. Uh, the committee will be aware that runs from 2015 to 20. 21, uh, and I would agreed the principles that should underpin customer charges. The investment programme is worth £3.5 billion. It is a, a massive uh, programme of investment. It will support growth by allowing new customers to connect to public services and will enable mandatory standards in relation to drinking water and environment to be met. In addition to that, uh, that scale of investment will support some 5,000 construction jobs across every part of the country. The government's contribution to that investment programme is £720 million of new loans, and in 2015-16 we will lend £80 million in support of the first year of the new investment programme. Charges for the next period are due to be confirmed by the end of this month by the Water Industry Commission. Uh, the Commission indicated in its draft determination in March that household charges will be capped at 1.6% and business charges will be frozen in nominal terms. Uh, so that's a quick run through the key headlines uh, of the budget convener and uh, with those remarks I'm happy to take questions from the committee. Okay, thank you very much. That was a, a quick run through. Um, if I could start off, Cabinet Secretary, um, I think the committee and the witnesses that we've had uh, on the budget have um, you know, to a large extent, welcomed the increased expenditure on um, investment on the investment budget. However, it's estimated that most of this increased expenditure is on projects and programmes that will, in the short to medium term, increase Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and there's even been a small reduction in the expenditure on projects and programmes that had the potential to reduce uh, that in the medium to long term. Um, and as we all know, uh, Scotland has missed the annual climate change targets in 2010, 11 and, and 12. So given that your portfolio contains many of the policy levers, in what ways do you think spending plans set out in the draft budget in this portfolio help Scotland to get back on track in meeting the forthcoming annual climate targets? Okay, um, let me try and answer that with some key points. If, if it's okay, I'll maybe touch on transport and housing separately there because they are you know, both very important areas of government responsibility in terms of meeting our climate change targets. 
let me say, just as the preface to my more detailed remarks, that uh, meeting our climate change targets uh, remains a key objective and priority of the government, and that objective uh, does run through all of our uh, budgetary uh, decision-making. In my own portfolio, if I look at um, transport, just uh, to take some uh, key points here that are pertinent and important in terms of uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and meeting our targets, uh, we're doing a number of things Many of these things were manifesto commitments for uh, the current government, uh, for example, developing uh, the infrastructure to support electric cars and increasing the proportion of transport spend that goes in low-carbon, active and sustainable transport. Uh, these are key priorities at the moment that will see um, emissions savings flow from investments that we're making now. Um, if I look uh, particularly at sustainable and uh, active travel, uh, we've committed uh, substantial funding over the, the current spending review period. Uh, so, you know, £200, and, 200 million pounds, uh, will be invested over 2012, 13 to 2014, 15 to reduce the carbon impact of transport. Uh, and in current plans, uh, that will be over £300 million over uh, 2013, 14 to 15, uh, 16. We're also doing um, a lot to develop uh, different networks and uh, develop some strategic partnerships to reduce transport emissions. Uh, for example, one that has a very long title here, so forgive me in advance, Switched on Scotland, a roadmap to widespread adoption of plug-in vehicles. Uh, that was developed uh, in conjunction with a wide range of partners launched, uh, I think, just over a year ago, uh, we've also instigated an annual cycling summit uh, with local authority leaders uh, to uh, lead on and monitor progress in our cycling action plan. Um, and lastly, in relation to transport, uh, point worth mentioning, our Future Transport Fund is supporting a range of sustainable transport infrastructure improvements, low-carbon vehicle fueling and charging infrastructure, green buses, shifting freight from road to rail and sea, and, of course, cycling and walking infrastructure. And the budget for the Future Transport Fund in 2015-16 uh, will be uh, up from 2014-15. It will uh, go up to 20.25 million from 18.75 million. Uh, if I turn uh, to housing, um, obviously the energy efficiency of our housing uh, plays a, a significant role uh, in meeting our climate change targets. Um, we're making, in my view, good progress on improving the energy efficiency of our housing stock. Uh, which has improved steadily since 2007. We've still got a lot of work to do, but we are making progress. Um, the Scottish House Conditions Survey indicates that in uh, 2012, 44% of homes had a, a good uh, rating in their energy performance certificate, which compares with only 16% in 2007. So that gives some idea of the scale of progress. Um, we also know that Scotland is outperforming the rest of uh, the UK on the delivery of energy efficiency measures through ECO, the energy company obligation. Uh, we have uh, seen nearly 12% of the total measures installed in Scotland, uh, while we have uh, just over 9% of the share of, of households. Uh, and we estimate that investment uh, under ECO uh, in 2013-14 was about £170 million, pounds, and we have a, an ongoing commitment to just under £80 million pounds of government funding in uh, household energy efficiency. So I, I could go on, uh, and I'm happy to go on for as long as you, you want me to, but these just give some examples and help to give a flavour of the, the particular approaches we are taking to make sure that we are... Uh, delivering spend and designing interventions across transport and housing uh, that are not just about making sure we've got the right transport infrastructure and the right uh, housing uh, provision, but we're doing that with a view to the environment and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, thanks. I'm sure my colleagues will uh, drill more deeply into this. And, Jim, you want to start off? Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary and colleagues. Um, the committee has been looking specifically at the impact of the budget on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and also whether the government is in a good place in terms of meeting our ambitious climate change reduction targets. Um, with that in mind, our predecessor committee 
as part of the 2011-12 draft budget scrutiny, said, and I quote, any future carbon assessment brought forward by the Scottish Government should adopt a methodology that would enable comparisons to be made from one year to the next to aid an understanding of how emissions from the budget are changing over time. However, a number of our witnesses in evidence have suggested that it is difficult to tell from the budget document what the actual impact of the spending plans will be on Scotland's climate change emissions targets. Now, I'm aware that there's a related document um, which sets out how the, the spending plans will support the delivery of the Climate Change Act implementation plan, but that, there's been quite a, a gap in the, the publication of the budget and the publication of that more detailed uh, analysis. So I'm just wondering whether we've actually got it right yet in terms of um, enabling government and the external environment to assess whether or not government is on track to meet its, its targets. Um, I would start my answer to that question by saying I don't think we should sit here and assume we've got everything right and there's nothing we can do better, both in terms of the substance of what we're doing to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also in how we report and monitor progress against that. So we will continue to listen to both the committee and to expert stakeholders about how we improve uh, how we, we do all of that. Uh, you uh, referred specifically to um, the document that's related uh, to the budget setting out how our spending plans support delivery of the Climate Change Act implementation. Um, I think that's the document you were referring to there, which was published uh, last week. Um, I've heard it, or I think I, I read it in some of the, the evidence to the committee that there had been some delay in the publication uh, of that, that document. Um, there's been no delay in that at all. Um, the information uh, was uh, published and the Minister for the Environment is, is currently in the process of uh, writing to committee chairs about it. That document is published as soon as it's practically possible to do so after we publish the level four uh, data, budget data, on which that information is based. Um, and that uh, allows uh, time for uh, additional parliamentary uh, analysis uh, of that. Uh, so that information is, is available there now and gives the committee the opportunity to look uh, in more detail at how our spending plans relate to our obligations under the, the Climate Change Act. And I've already run through some of the uh, headlines of that. Um, so that information is there for the committee's uh, use. Can we do it better? We should always try to do these things better. We should always try to improve and refine. I know that some organisations have... Uh, pointed to the use of carbon accounting methodologies to monitor trends uh, over time. Um, and, you know, I think there's uh, some work the government's uh, keen on doing there, not just to enable us to better monitor trends, but to make sure that kind of exercise is consistent across the public sector as well. For that, um, I, I'm not going to push you on the, the issue of the delay. I understand, I'm content with the explanation uh, that you provided. I know that witnesses will have heard that, um, other than to observe, obviously, that that is not something we've been able to factor into our, our process of, and the witnesses haven't been able to take that into account. But I'm sure, they'll, being the intelligent people that they are, they'll find ways of communicating with the committee if there are issues there that they want to raise. But the, the wider point is, of course, that um, by supporting um, investment in infrastructure, as you've outlined this morning, um, such as support for active travel, this can have a very beneficial impact uh, on reducing our, our greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, Active travel will have an ongoing impact on health spending. Improving energy efficiency of existing homes would, can result in a reduction in fuel poverty. How do you make sure that when you're um, prioritising spend and you're allocating spend that you're taking these kind of issues into account? Well, we do that um, partly by common sense, but partly by a very systematic uh, process. So, you know, the government's got a policy appraisal uh, toolkit that states that any potential intervention should consider financial, economic, welfare, distributional benefits. Um, if you take transport as a, a particular area of the budget, uh, Scottish Transport Appraisal Guidance uh, has a, a section that looks at policy integration impacts, and you know these would look uh, not just uh, at the financial impact or uh, in terms of what you're talking about 
uh, climate change impact, but disability, health, rural affairs, social inclusion. So right across uh, how we uh, budget, uh, we try to assess and factor into our decision making the various different impacts that any one particular policy intervention would have. And underlying your question is a, a premise that I absolutely agree with. You know, if, if you improve cycling or walking, sustainable transport generally, then yes, you're going to have a, a positive impact on the environment, but you're going to impact people's health and, and well-being as well. We know if you take uh, housing as a, another uh, area that if we invest in the energy efficiency of housing, then absolutely we will have a positive impact on uh, greenhouse gas emissions over time, but we'll also improve health, we'll improve the uh, cost effectiveness in terms of people heating their homes, will improve the well-being of people that comes from living in uh, warm, uh, watertight homes. And, you know, we've got a, an analysis that suggests, just as, a, as an illustrative example, that every £100 million we spend on energy efficiency measures, we also create more than 1,000 jobs across the country. So there's an economic impact as well. So that interrelated policy uh, impact is something that feeds right through our decision making on, on all budgetary issues. Okay. You, you mentioned um, carbon accounting methodologies. Can I just ask you specifically, uh, when we're developing those to monitor trends, uh, is there any particular work the Scottish Government is undertaking to help standardise these methodologies so that all of that work can be appropriately cross-referenced? Well, the, the specific um, work the government's doing, uh, which is uh, work that we're doing through the public body's uh, duties under the Climate Change Act, is to work with uh, local authorities in the wider public sector, health boards, education, uh, higher education institutions, NDPDs, uh, B NDPBs and uh, government agencies to look at how we standardise uh, and uh, make consistent the, the monitoring and reporting of operational emissions from the public sector estate. I'm not going to uh, attempt to go into all of the complexities that I'm about to uh, refer to, but carbon accounting is a very complex topic and, and the methodology adopted uh, can depend on the purpose and the nature of the monitoring being undertaken. Uh, there is UK and indeed I think there's international uh, guidance available for organisations uh, to use when they're measuring and reporting environmental uh, impacts and you know all organisations should use approaches that are appropriate and proportionate to their particular activities but the work we're doing is to try as far as possible to make sure that there's a consistency of methodology and a consistency of reporting and monitoring across the, the whole public sector, which I think in years to come will be useful to a committee like this as well as useful in terms of uh, making sure that we are meeting our targets. Uh, thank you. Can I just ask you finally about um, active travel? A, a point has come up in evidence from witnesses, specifically Spokes and Transform, Transform Scotland, have pointed to the fact there's a need for greater clarity of how the actual funds are to be spent on active travel, because that's not always clear. And I, I, I um, readily can see this is possibly a question more for officials than it is for you, Cabinet Secretary, but nonetheless, it is an issue that causes them concern. So the example that they've given is that there are two funds at the moment, Sustainable and Active Travel Fund and the Future Transport Fund, um, but it's, it's obscure as to how much of, that, of the money within those uh, allocated expenditures is actually spent on active travel. So it does strike me that if the government is increasing investment as it says it is, and as I believe it is, they're not necessarily getting the credit for that because it's not clear in these budget headings um, how much of that money is being spent on active travel. And the suggestion they've made is that in order to um, support greater transparency, uh, you could replace these two budget lines by having one for active travel and another for other future stroke green transport. Now, is that something that um, the government would be willing to, to look at and consider? I'm, I'm happy to take that away and consider that. I mean, I, I recognise the, the issue that's been raised. And, you know, it's not in the government's, I think, as you kind of indicated, it's not in the government's interest for the money that we're spending to be obscured in the, the kind of midst of a, a complicated budget document. So, you know, if there's a way we can make that more uh, transparent, easier to understand, easier for 
people to, to see exactly where that money's going, then I'm happy to, to go away and look at that. The one caveat, which I, I think I've inserted into discussions like this in the past, is we've also got an obligation to make sure that you as a committee and Parliament as a whole can look year to year in our budget and kind of draw lines between you know, the, the, the different lines year on year to see what the trends are. So uh, often, if we change how budget lines are presented, we can run into a, a criticism from the other end, which is that we're making it difficult to compare year on year. But with all of that um, stated, I'm, I'm more than happy to look at this. I personally think there's probably an even uh, deeper issue than the one you uh, have outlined there, because there will be other parts of the budget and there'll be other parts of activity which include support for sustainable and active travel that are not shown in either of, of those lines. Let me give you uh, just one example of that. If you take the new rail franchise, you know, there is much in that that is about supporting infrastructure for cycling at stations and on trains. Now, that won't show in either of the budget lines you've spoken about, but nevertheless, it's support for active travel that is supported by government investment. So maybe as well as what you're asking me to consider, we need to consider how we draw out all of uh, the support for this particular uh, area from all of the different parts of the budget to make uh, it easier to look at the totality of the support we're providing. Thank you. All right, if we move on to uh, other transport issues or transport issues in general, um, Mark. Thank you, Kimira. There was consensus from a lot of the witnesses that the government had a, a strong record of support for sustainable and active travel and that there were a lot of good um, pilot projects um, and strong um, work done by local authorities and universities in developing those um, projects which could make a difference um, to the government achieving the greenhouse gas emission targets but there was consensus again about a concern that these projects weren't being rolled out quickly enough right across the whole country and that more funding um, was needed and that the government should look at benchmarking with other northern European countries and move more towards 10% um, of the transport budget being allocated to that sustainable and active travel, um, particularly given additional um, social and health benefits. Does the, the Cabinet Secretary agree with those witnesses who have called for more funding in that, in that budget line? Um, I absolutely uh, sympathise with the sentiment behind uh, those comments and the sentiment behind the question, I, I think I can say uh, fairly categorically on the part of the government, we are uh, very, very anxious to maximise the support we can give to sustainable and active travel, not just because of its impact on the environment, but for all of the other benefits that Jim Eady referred to in, in his questioning. Uh, that's why we have been increasing uh, the budget line uh, here, and you know we've seen... Uh, if, into, if you look at uh, the increase uh, into next year's budget, quite a substantial increase in sustainable and active travel and the future transport fund as well, albeit that uh, I've, I've said we'll look at how that's presented. So we are uh, doing what we can within a budget that is fixed. So we, we have to make choices and every time we increase spending on one thing, we have to take that investment from somewhere else. I think we have put forward a, a draft budget that gives uh, proper uh, priority to these issues, uh, but we have a, a willingness and an appetite to go further in future if we can uh, find that resource within uh, the budget. In terms of your, the first part of your question, which was about uh, the speed at which pilot approaches are scaled up, rolled out, and looking to benchmark ourselves across uh, experience from other countries. I think you particularly mentioned Nordic countries. Um, I've got a lot of sympathy with that uh, as well. I, I, I wouldn't just apply this to uh, sustainable and active travel. I think if you look across government, sometimes I think of many examples in my former responsibilities as health secretary, particularly around e-health, for example, where we are not always, and 
you know, the issues involved are very different, but we're not always as perhaps as quick as we could be at taking experience from small scale trials and scaling that up into a larger, a larger scale. So I think there is more we can do uh, there and we should be challenging ourselves all along. I mean, one of the other issues I picked up as I read through the evidence to the committee was uh, a commentary around uh, long term certainty. Uh, of funding. Um, again, something that I, I absolutely understand uh, where uh, that comes from. Uh, and we've been very keen to set out a long-term strategic commitment to sustainable and active travel through uh, not just the, the recent track record of funding that I've spoken about, but also the cycling action plan for Scotland, uh, the RPP2 commitments. Uh, what we run into, though, is a UK spending review timetable that means Right now, for example, we can't commit to more than a one-year uh, budget at this time. So we, we have a constraint there, but within that constraint, we want to give as much certainty through long-term strategic plans as, as we can. And as I started out by saying, we want to give as much uh, support to sustainable and active travel as we can within the constraints of our overall budget. I mean, that, that point you raised there about uh, long-term funding has been something, as you said, that that had been raised, that was one of the criticisms that particularly when it comes to to match funding um, that, that long term um, certainty was would be beneficial I think Sir Strand spoke about being able to allocate £19 million pounds of funding that required to be match funded and the, I mean they were well outbid I think it was £23 million pounds of applications that they received to match fund that so the appetite is certainly there amongst local authorities and that um, long-term plan would certainly benefit. But I recognise the constraints around the UK spending review. Uh, another concern that was raised, particularly by Sustrans and um, Stop Climate Chaos, and it comes back to your point about the balance of spend in the budget, was the focus particularly on um, spending on roads and would just to ask if, if you believe that the current spending um, and the, the road building programme is the best use of government funds in the long term to tackle greenhouse gas emissions and congestion? Sorry, a, a certain Conservative member was nodding vigorously as you posed that question to me there. Um, our road building programme fulfils a number of our objectives within the, the overall purpose we set ourselves as a government, which is uh, to you know, make the country more successful through increasing uh, sustainable economic growth. Um, and if you look at our own ongoing motorway and trunk road programme, that will return significant benefits to the country. It will deliver uh, substantial direct economic savings to businesses uh, and individuals. Uh, these are saving, savings that flow from better transport links. Uh, we'll also see uh, benefits through greater road safety, better accessibility. Um, so, you know, the benefits of our uh, current transport investment programme, I think, are there uh, for, for all to see. Now, moving on to the kind of crux of, of your question, does that run, run counter to our uh, objectives around uh, reducing emissions and meeting our climate change targets? And I think, you know, what is fair to say is that all other things being equal, and I, and I stress that first part of my sentence, all other things being equal, if you increase uh, road kilometres for whatever reason, then that will lead to an increase in road emissions. Uh, the thing is, not all other things are equal. You know, the, the other side of the equation is not in equilibrium. Uh, so you know, the RPP sets out uh, the, the various ways in which we are intervening to... Uh, cut emissions per road kilometre travelled and it also sets out importantly the other measures were taken to encourage mode switching uh, so that we can bear down on the actual number of uh, road kilometres that are, are driven, cut down in congestion and so these bear down on the emissions per kilometre so it's not a case that all other things are equal and you invest in roads and emissions go up and just you know, a couple of examples of the effect of what I'm talking about in transport might be helpful for the committee. Um, the average emissions from new cars has fallen year on year by over 20% in the last decade. Um, if you look at uh, 
2012, which I think is the last year we've got these figures for, 55% of new cars registered in Scotland uh, fell into the category of emitting less than 130 grams of uh, CO2 emissions per kilometre. 55%. Ten years ago, that percentage was 3%. So, you know, we are improving on that side of things so that we're not in this situation where other things are equal. So I accept readily there is an ongoing uh, tension running through this. But you know, I also know that the country needs modern fit-for-purpose transport infrastructure to keep our economy uh, strong and competitive. But we've got to balance that with the measures we're taking to ensure that we're cutting emissions through the fuel efficiency of the cars on the road, uh, encouraging people where they can not to use cars, uh, encouraging as far as possible uh, the mode switching that I spoke about. So these are you know, two sides of an equation that we have to keep uh, in balance and you know, we try to do that through all of the decisions we take. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we move on to housing, Adam. Uh, thank you, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks a significant increase in the housing and regeneration budget, something like 37%. And you'll be pleased to know that that's been warmly welcomed by the witnesses uh, that we've had before us. And indeed, um, agreement with the general policy direction of the government in this area. However, there were concerns that this would be targeted at the appropriate mix of housing to meet housing demand and targeting of these funds for optimal greenhouse gas reductions across Scotland's uh, housing stock. So how would you respond to those concerns? Um, let me take them in uh, two parts, which would be appropriate since your question, I think it was in two parts, in terms of the mix of houses okay. and how we ensure investment in houses that are meeting energy mm. efficiency. Standards. I mean, before I, I come on to that, though, I think it is just important to reflect on the substantial increase in investment in the overall housing and regeneration budget, but looking particularly at the affordable housing supply programme budget uh, for next year, that's uh, £390 million, which is uh, an increase of about 21% on the average of the previous three-year period. So uh, I hope that is a very very strong signal of the importance the government attaches to housing for social purposes, but also for uh, the purposes of economic recovery. In terms of um, the part of your question about the appropriate mix of houses, uh, we take a, a resource planning approach which effectively puts councils in the driving seat of deciding their uh, strategic approach. So deciding what the appropriate mix is in their own particular area. And that you know, enables them to be flexible uh, and to look strategically across their area to, to determine what is required. They then uh, put forward proposals to the Scottish Government for uh, social and affordable housing developments. And all of that should be based on their local housing strategy. So we take an approach that is not about the government looking across Scotland as a whole and deciding what housing developments are needed where and with what mix of house types and tenures. Uh, we think local authorities are in the best position to assess, based on their local housing strategy, what the needs of their own areas are. Um, so that's the, the mix. In terms of how we contribute to building homes that are more sustainable and more energy efficient, uh, we are uh, strongly encouraging developments to be built to a higher level of sustainability than the current minimum requirements would demand. Uh, and we offer an additional £4,000 uh, subsidy per house through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme. So there is additional money that can be accessed for houses that meet a higher uh, standard of energy efficiency and sustainability. Um, all new homes that are built uh, within the Affordable uh, Housing Supply Programme uh, will help to make a, a very significant contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, because they emit round about 70% less CO2 than a house built, an equivalent house built in, say, 19. 
90. So that helps to reduce emissions. It also helps to reduce fuel bills for uh, people living in those houses. And uh, from October next year, uh, improvement to new build energy standards uh, will reduce carbon dioxide emissions by around 21% for new dwellings when uh, compared to current levels. Uh, and these standards are going to be slightly more demanding uh, than standards set across the rest of the UK. So I hope that gives some sense of, uh, you know, obviously our affordable housing budget is trying to get as many houses built as possible. But how we, uh, how we allocate that budget is intended to ensure that we're getting investment to where it's needed and in the way it's needed and that the way we're building houses is designed to make sure that we're contributing to the climate change target requirements. Okay. Thank, um, sticking to energy efficiency, um, Cabinet Secretary, what investment does the Scottish Government believe is necessary to cut emissions while also helping to eradicate fuel poverty? You mentioned in your opening remarks something like 70 to 80 million pounds uh, in the, is dedicated in a budget to energy efficient, efficiency measures. Now, some of our witnesses indicated that while this is welcome, it was short of what was actually needed. I think uh, existing uh, Homes Alliance Scotland indicated a figure of 125 million. And that was before we heard about the loss of funds from the energy company obligations uh, measures uh, to improve existing housing stock, which you also mentioned in your opening remarks. Um, we understand that there's, there's some £50 million pounds been taken off uh, uh, that, that funding. So there is an issue there in terms of sustaining and maintaining and improving uh, funding for energy efficiency measures in the current housing stock. Um, could I ask for, for your response to that, please, Cabinet Secretary? Okay. Um, there have been changes to ECO, and there are you know, changes to ECO underway just now that in a whole variety of ways uh, you know, have complicated and made things more difficult. Some changes have been uh, welcome, but you know, one of the frustrations we have is we don't control the overall design of these energy efficiency uh, schemes. I'm on record and will continue to say that it would be far better if we were able to de design, have responsibility in design these schemes ourselves that would allow us to integrate and align them with our own activity much easier and, and much uh, better. In terms of the scale of uh, funding, as I indicated I think in my opening remarks, we're committed uh, to spending £79 million uh, a year through our home energy efficiency programmes. Um, but the key thing about that investment is that that investment is then intended to lever in additional investment under uh, both ECO and other sources so that we uh, intend to create a combined fund of around £200 million a year. Now, exactly what that will be will depend on our success at leveraging in uh, that extra money. But our, we've got a good track record um, in that to date. Um, I think I mentioned earlier on as well the uh, recent statistics that come from DEC, which show that Scotland is outperforming the rest of uh, Great Britain on the delivery of measures through ECO. Um, I won't go into all of these stats again because I think I mentioned them earlier on. We're getting about 12% of measures versus 9% of households. Um, so investment under ECO, taken with our own uh, budget allocations, uh, which is our energy efficiency programmes, warm homes fund, green homes, cash back, all of that would indicate a total investment in the order of about £260 million, which is in excess of the £200 million that I, I spoke about. Um, so that's what we've got to, to spend. I think we can do an awful lot with that. I suppose like any other area of the budget, if you had more, you would like to to be able to allocate more, but I think from, I think I'm correct in still saying this, I'm, I'm sure if I'm not correct in saying this, somebody will correct me, if not today, then in future, uh, that we're the only, uh, certainly uh, England uh, now doesn't have government funded energy efficiency programmes. So I think with the commitment we've got to the £79 million pounds of government investment every year, uh, that does set us apart from certainly some other jurisdictions across the UK. 
Yeah, I think I, I'm not talking out of turn here, but uh, I think the consensus view in the committee is that um, energy efficiency in our, in our homes should be a national infrastructure priority, and I, I would imagine that will form part of our, um, our report uh, on, on the budget process, uh, Cabinet Secretary. So I hope you... I would welcome that, because I agree it should be a... A national, it is a national priority. I, I think we could, and we do. I think some of the facts and figures and information I've given there suggest that we're doing uh, reasonably well, if I can uh, put it as modestly as that. But if we were, if we had more responsibility for the design of something like Eco and able to align that better with the government funding, I think we could do even better than we're doing um, and you know hopefully in the not too distant future we might have that we could also do something I spoke about during the referendum we could decide not to fund the, the, the main part of our energy efficiency program through energy bills we could do that through central government funding which would take some pressure off energy bills and allow that funding to be secured more progressively than it is when it's put on everybody's energy bill, regardless of their income or, or circumstances. So there would be a lot of benefits to us as a parliament having more responsibility in this area. Thank you for that. Um, Mary, did you want to just come in? It's just a supplementary, and it follows on from the, the previous question around um, energy efficiency. And, and it has been suggested in evidence that the Greener Innovation Funds could be used to greater effect to incentivise builders to go beyond minimum standards and also provide financial support for smaller um, building companies when, when they're building. And I suppose part of my question is around, um, if you look at the, kind of the chicken and egg principle, because for, for companies to, to energy proof and put in all the measures in, in their homes and then reflect it in the price, um, it's about allowing consumers to understand or, or house buyers to understand the benefits of buying the house. So it is about the demand needs to be there. People need to fully understand. We need to use the funds better. And I just wonder how we can use the funds to incentivise, encourage, but also educate people about the value of buying greener homes. I think that's a good question. I think we are through the various funding streams we have here, including, though it's probably not the central premise of your question, through what I spoke about in terms of the affordable housing uh, supply programme, we are trying to incentivise uh, those who build houses to go beyond minimum standards. Uh, we are about to consult um, in the spring next year on draft uh, minimum energy efficiency standards for private homes, both owner-occupied and private rented sector, private homes. Um, and minimum energy efficiency standards can then help to drive and stimulate demand for, for low carbon homes. Uh, we, we engage at, and we are engaging actively with stakeholders to look at the opportunities to increase demand to help to drive the market. And that definitely involves work with consumers, both to, I suppose, identify what matters to them when they're buying a home, uh, but also do what you're saying, which is to... Um, raise awareness and understanding amongst home buyers of the benefits, not just in terms of the environment, but in a much kind of more immediate sense in terms of the cost of heating their home, of buying low carbon energy efficiency homes. So there's an awful lot of, if, if the committee is interested in some of the work in terms of demand stimulation and consumer um, awareness uh, that's, that's ongoing around that, we can provide some more information. But I think it's, uh, it's a very important aspect of this work. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That theme a little bit on, on the need to stimulate the demand for energy efficiency housing. It has been suggested by some of our witnesses that the Scottish Government should consider using uh, its tax raising powers to stimulate demand for ener energy efficiency, energy efficient housing. For example, using the land and building transaction tax bans to incentivise energy efficiency housing or using energy ratings as conditions in any help to buy schemes? Um, I mean, I am very, very open to looking at how we design our schemes and, and use the powers we've got to, uh, 
improve energy efficiency and to stimulate demand. Um, it, it was an issue that was discussed during the passage of the uh, land and buildings transaction tax bill. Um, there were amendments to that effect that that should be used to try to stimulate uh, take up of energy efficiency measures. Parliament didn't choose to go down that road for a variety of uh, different reasons. Um, but in general, yes, we should be looking at how we, we do that. It, you know, as was the case with the land and buildings tax, the there are often very good reasons why what is proposed won't have the desired effect, and that was certainly our judgment of the proposals around LBTT, but we should be very open-minded to, and particularly put tax aside in how we design energy efficiency schemes and how we fund the building of houses and how we are directing the resource we've got around this to, to stimulate demand to increase people's appetite for the uptake of energy efficiency measures. Okay, if we move on to digital infrastructure, Alex. Mr. Convener, the, when we spoke to expert witnesses over the last couple of weeks, we got a clear indication that while there was a, a certain satisfaction with the level of investment in digital infrastructure, that they still believed that it's a field in which a little more could go a very long way. Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary uh, convinced that sufficient investment is being put into digital infrastructure? Um, I'm satisfied there is very significant investment uh, being put into digital infrastructure and an absolutely necessary investment going into digital infrastructure just now. As you uh, will be very well aware, because we've spoken about it at committee before, the vast majority of the current investment we are uh, making is uh, on the delivery of the two next generation uh, fibre broadband projects that are currently uh, under delivery by BT. Um, total public sector investment in these two projects over five years is uh, almost £300 million, so it's significant investment, and obviously there's investment by BT on top of that. Um, there's also been some further investment um, announced, and we are also investing through community uh, broadband Scotland in community-based schemes for those areas where next generation broadband will probably still not go. So uh, th 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 those figures I've given you there actually for, uh, I'm sure, reasons of uh, budget uh, history don't appear in this uh, portfolio. The funding for this, although responsibility lies in my portfolio, the funding lines are shown in the rural, rural affairs uh, portfolio. So there is significant investment underway uh, there in terms of providing the infrastructure. Um, now, that investment is absolutely necessary, not least because of what it's doing to uh, bring a, a backhaul network to a lot of our island and uh, remote communities for the first time. But although it's necessary investment, it's not sufficient on its own to deliver our you know, 2020 vision of world-class digital infrastructure. Uh, we've recently uh, charged Scottish Futures Trust to look ahead of this investment, to look at uh, identifying technical options for delivering connectivity, you know, anytime, anywhere, using any uh, device, but also to look at how we explore appropriate financial models uh, for the investment of the future that will come after uh, this investment. So there is some initial work underway on that just now that will lead to um, an analysis of options probably that will be available in, in the spring of, of next year, and that will start to provide us with the basis for future investment plans. There's also a whole other issue which is integrally connected, but it's about uh, how we increase and improve uptake of digital infrastructure as well as providing the infrastructure which we're investing in as well. Without wishing to dwell on my personal grief, uh, I've maybe mentioned it to you before, that I, that I live in the centre of a town that got high-speed broadband and a blaze of publicity two years ago, and I can't get it because I live too near the I've told you, we've, we've deliberately excluded you from it. <laughs> Indeed, uh, I suspect that's the case. But it does highlight that there are uh, a range of difficulties across the country. So what steps are being taken to improve access of individuals and businesses to superfast fibre network in order that the potential of Scotland's digital infrastructure can be properly realised in short order? Um, I should, for the record, uh, make it clear we didn't deliberately exclude <laughs> Alec Johnson from... <laughs> uh, 
um, in case people in years to come look back on the official report and think that we were a very, very uh, cruel government. I think I wrote to you about that. Did I write to you about you raised that before or am I thinking of somebody else? I think I may have written to you about your particular uh, I don't know if there. I have seen that. Uh, if I haven't and I'm mixing mm -hmm. that up with another letter, I will uh, mm -hmm. be happy to address in the fullness of time uh, the particular issue in, in the locality you talk about. Uh, more generally, what are we doing? Well, the infrastructure here is vital, so you can't you know, give people access to infrastructure that doesn't exist, so the, the infrastructure investment is vital. So too is the investment that is looking at going beyond where this main investment will take us, to the parts of the country that are particularly hard to reach. Um, there is some top-up investment to our main investment, which will help us do that. The Community Broadband Scotland, we've increased funding of it from £5 million to £7.5 million, working with communities to look at bespoke solutions that will help them in their own localities. We're also investing in uh, demand stimulation so that you know there's no point having this infrastructure if we're not equipping and enabling individuals and businesses to take full advantage of it. So there's a, a whole programme of work here from the provision of the infrastructure through to you know the, the skills and the ability of businesses in particular to take advantage of it that is that is ongoing. Um, I, you know, my, my very strong view is that this in the modern age is as vital as a good transport infrastructure. Um, and with the investment we are putting in, because of the geography and the topography of Scotland, there will inevitably still be people uh, who struggle to get the kind of quality of access that those of us living in urban areas take for granted. But we are making a step change at the moment through this investment in terms of who and how many people will be able to access next generation broadband. And it is significantly ahead, significantly ahead in parts of the country of where the market itself would have ever taken us. Mm -hmm. And finally, in this issue, perhaps the, some of the discussion we've had has raised the idea that there may need to be further regulation to open up infrastructure to competition. Do you think the regulatory environment as it exists in Scotland today is adequate to take forward what we need to do or do we need to look at regulation in the longer term to open up competition? Are we talking specifically about digital? Yes. Um, I think there are undoubtedly uh, improvements that could be made. I, I don't want to you know, immediately start banging a, a more powers drum, but there is an issue here about the split of responsibilities, you know, where we have a responsibility around fixed broadband, mobile, telephony is still largely the responsibility of, of the UK government. Uh, there are issues about, uh, you know, mobile telephony should uh, any, you know, if, if you should be able to pick up any signal anywhere. So there's, there's lots of discussions ongoing, not just with the Scottish Government, generally about how uh, regulation in this area should develop. So, you know, I, I think undoubtedly there are in the future different and, and arguably better ways we could look to regulate in order to get the best services for people. Thank you. Can I just follow up on Alex's point about, um, you know, we get a BT and the government saying, you know, this and that, those communities are now connected to super fast. I think there is a disconnect between that happening and people realising that they have to take a step themselves to get that super fast into their homes. Is enough being done by the providers to encourage people to take that step to, to access what the infrastructure that's being put in? Um, I, I hope so, but I'm certainly very happy to, to look at this and look at this on an ongoing basis because, uh, you know, as I keep saying, having the infrastructure is one thing, making sure people are using it and accessing it is, is another. The infrastructure that BT is providing, of course, is, is open source, so it's not, you don't have to have BT as your provider in your, your home, you can use uh, anybody. Um, so I'm, I'm more than happy to look at this. We're, we're trying to be as open and transparent around the, the development of the infrastructure as possible. And that you know, there's a website people can go to to look at progress. Uh, that also involves being very careful that we're not raising expectations in a particular community ahead of the proper surveys and technical work being done to ensure that that community will be a beneficiary of, of the, the project. So there's a, a, a cautious approach, but we're trying to take a very open and transparent 
approach. But the particular issue you're raising about are people getting enough information and awareness that they then have to make sure they're accessing that, I'm very happy to go away and look at that and see if there's more we can do or encourage our partners to do to uh, make people more aware than they are. OK, thanks. Um, Gil. Yeah, could I uh, raise some questions about the future opportunities uh, and uh, on innovative uh, ideas, uh, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, could the Cabinet Secretary highlight any innovative uh, practice or programmes that the Scottish Government is considering uh, for future investment uh, or infrastructure plans that could contribute to meeting their GHG emission targets, improve traffic congestion and suspo uh, support sustainable and active travel? Um, there's a whole range of innovative approaches we're trying to take right across the, the spectrum of government and you know, within this portfolio in particular so I could you know, run through um, a range of different um, innovative funding uh, methods that we're using in terms of construction of houses which are not all solely about reducing greenhouse gas emissions a, a lot of that is about how we get more houses built for the available uh, resource that we've got in terms of, uh, particularly around greenhouse uh, gas emissions, as the policies that are in RPP2 are rolled out uh, and evaluated, what we get are emerging findings on the measures that are more successful, uh, and you know that that then allows us to look at how we can be more innovative. Technology also doesn't stand still, so we've got to. Uh, keep abreast of, of that. Uh, the pilot study, for example, of Smarter Choices, Smarter Places um, identified that mode share, mode share uh, changes are achievable in targeted populations. So our further round of uh, funding next year for that highlights what we now think are the most appropriate uh, and effective approaches to take uh, to that. You know, we're doing uh, work on a alternative fuels where we're actively supporting the development of hydrogen as a, a fuel source. Uh, Aberdeen, I think, uh, is shortly going to see the first hydrogen bus operational. Um, and Aberdeen City Council, I understand, has already got two hydrogen fuel vans in its fleet. Uh, mobile technology, the ability to use apps to better plan journeys, to use uh, smart ticketing and pay for services that way are other examples of how we're trying to be innovative both in the in how services are delivered to make them easier to access for people but how we encourage people to shift from cars to public transport and to use more fuel efficient means of transport so these are just some examples you know but I could go right across or could send the committee uh, information you know in, in much more detail about how we're trying to be innovative but also make sure that we're not left standing as technology moves on. OK, thanks for that. Can I further ask you, in order to meet the GHG emission reduction targets of at least 42% by 2020, what the Scottish Government's spending priorities for the next five years are likely to be? Um, well, obviously our spending priorities for next year are, are set out in the budget that we are discussing, I said earlier on in relation to Mark Griffin, you know, we, because of the UK spending review cycle, cannot set out spending plans beyond uh, that one year uh, time scale at the moment. But in terms of our spending priorities, you know, much of what I've been talking about today uh, will form our priorities. So making sure the country has the right infrastructure to support economic uh, sustainable economic growth to meet our targets in terms of emissions reduction, to make sure we're providing houses that people need where they need them uh, with the right mix of tenure, making sure we've got a transport infrastructure that is both servicing our economy but supporting that shift in uh, the way people travel that will further support our uh, climate change obligations. So these are our, speaking within this portfolio, these are our broad uh, priorities how they will then be supported by specific spending plans will require to wait until the other side of the UK spending review so that we can set those out in the knowledge that comes from that. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening remarks you mentioned the new borrowing powers that the government has. Um, can I just clarify, um, you mentioned I think the 10%, the, the 304 million um, that the government intends to borrow in 2015-16. 
Do you know how much of that will be or has been already in the budget allocated to infrastructure and what projects will figure in that spend? I'm not clear whether the, the level two financial transactions includes part of that 304. Can you clarify? The, the borrowing um, capacity that we will have uh, will support our overall capital programme, so it's not allocated to individual specific projects. So you won't look at the budget and see you know, some of that goes to a particular hospital or roads or school. It is taken into account, that capacity is taken into account in the overall assessment of what we're able to invest uh, across our capital uh, programme. Um, so I suppose the simplest way of, of putting it is it's looking ahead to uh, the borrowing powers has enabled us to increase the total level of, of investment that we estimate that we can undertake over uh, the, the period that we're, we're talking about. Um, and that increased level of investment is reflected in the draft budget uh, that we're, we're scrutinising today. Um, I think it's important just to, to stress that point. The, the borrowing powers are not limited to individual project finance. Um, so we'll draw down on £304 million is what we estimate it will be, borrowing that will be available in 2015-16 as we require it. And that will then sit with all of our other uh, available resources to support the overall investment programme that is reflected across the budget. OK, thanks. Uh, Mary, you had some extra questions on housing. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask an additional question around housing, Cabinet Secretary. And it's around the increase in the, the level four um, figure for housing supply. And it's expected to provide 6,000 affordable homes, of which 4,000 will be social homes, and will allow the government to continue to support innovative financial finance methods for housing, the housing sector. And I just wonder, Cabinet Secretary, if you have any more detail on the exact mix within the, the 6,000 homes that will be built of what that would look like. And obviously the help to buy has been very successful. And again, I wonder if you could perhaps give us some detail around what other types of innovative finance methods you intend to use. OK, um, in terms of the first part of your question, um, Looking at the affordable housing supply uh, budget, which I've already said is um, £390 million, uh, the majority of the homes that will be supported through that will be homes for social rent, uh, but there will also be homes for mid-market rent in there. There will be some shared equity provision in there uh, as well. Uh, these will be delivered mostly through grant, but there will also be some uh, loan funding for our open market shared equity scheme, for example. We also give guarantees through loan funding for the National Housing Trust. Um, in terms of... So we, we have an outturn report every year from the Affordable Housing Programme that we'll be able, in due course, to let you look back and see what the exact mix... I can't tell you now, looking forward, what the exact mix will be, um, but I think I have the breakdown for 2013-14 where seven, just over 7,000, 7,012 affordable housing completions, uh, and of them, 4,368 were social housing uh, completions. Uh, so that gives you a sense of what the kind of breakdown there was. But in due course, that very precise information will become available for future years as well. Okay. And the second part of your question, remind me, was around innovative financing. I think you mentioned at the start of that, part of your question, help to buy, um, which has been hugely successful and we're continuing to support help to buy into next year. We've made some changes to the eligibility and I make no apology for that. We want that money to be able... We've got a finite resource uh, and we want the resource we are allocating to help to buy, which is £100 million next year, to help as many people access uh, the housing ladder as possible. Um, other innovative uh, ways, we, we, we've got quite a substantial um, chunk of our funding in housing now comes from financial transactions from the UK government. Now, I should say I wouldn't choose to uh, receive funding in that form because it severely restricts what we can do with it. Effectively, it's loan funding that has to be repaid and there's, a, there's limits to how we can invest that. So, you know, it's, it's welcome in the sense that it's 
resource we wouldn't otherwise have, but I would rather just have straight funding that gives us proper flexibility. So uh, much of the financial transaction funding is being used on what would be described as innovative ways of funding housing. F for example, uh, just some illustrative examples of that would be around open market shared equity. We're looking to extend that. We've got housing infrastructure uh, loan schemes, which are trying to unlock housing developments by offering up some funding for some of the infrastructure development that has to go around them. Uh, the National Housing Trust has been very successful and we're looking, have developed and will continue to look at variants of that that will be appropriate in different circumstances. We have uh, invested, it's pretty groundbreaking in many respects, in charitable bonds uh, to support construction of social housing and uh, some community project financing, things like the Warm Homes Fund to tackle fuel poverty. These are all innovative ways of trying to invest in things that we all want to invest in and also help us to use a particular form of funding through the financial transactions that isn't as easy to use as straight grant funding is. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, and Gil? I note that uh, the financial charges for N N NPD and PPP uh, are not uh, actually stated specifically in the budget itself. So I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could say how much that the I IC funding line has been spent on NPD and PPD uh, PPP projects uh, payments. Um, there may be more information I can send to the committee about this afterwards, but. The first thing to say is there's no NPD payments in 2015-16 because none of those projects have yet got to the stage where we're starting to make the revenue payments for them. Um, so what will appear, or what is included rather, in the 2015-16 line will be uh, PPP contract payments. And in budgetary terms, within the IIC portfolio for 2015-16, those payments will amount to in the region of £89 million. Um, and they relate to three transport PFI projects, uh, M6, M77 and the M80 steps to HAGS. So that's the extent of uh, PPP revenue payments. Um, I think the first, within the transport side of things and the current NPD investment programme, probably uh, the first payments uh, there will kick in in 2016-17 uh, and will flow from the M8, M73, M74 uh, motorway improvements. If there's more information, I'd be happy to see what the committee wants and, and provide it, but those are the, the headline figures. I suppose it's an ongoing operation to try and find ways to uh, reduce uh, these charges. Uh, well, these are, I mean, these are charges we, you know, in terms of the, the legacy ones we, yeah. we have to live with. In terms of NPD, um, you know, NPD is a far better way of financing infrastructure projects than the old uh, PPP uh, method was. Um, I think what comes into play here and is very, very important is what I referred to, I think, in my opening remarks. Whether it's NPD, the legacy PPP, borrowing capacity, uh, any scheme where we're effectively uh, borrowing in order to pay through our revenue budgets over a longer period of time, uh, we set the 5% ceiling on that so that no more than 5% of our uh, Dell revenue budget is being taken up by ongoing revenue payments. And I think that's an important discipline for us. We want to invest as much as we can in infrastructure, but we have to be mindful of the obligations that's putting on revenue budgets, perhaps for you know, many, many, many years into the future. Yeah. Thanks so much. Anyone else got any further questions? Any further comments, Cabinet Secretary? No, um, I think there was a couple of uh, items as I went through that I offer to send more information, we'll follow that up and if there's any further information that the committee wants uh, before concluding its report, we'd be happy to provide it. OK, 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will suspend the meeting uh, for a few minutes. Uh, we're slightly ahead of time and we're going to be joined by other uh, MSPs for the next session. So I will suspend the meeting.
Okay, if we can resume committee proceedings. I, agenda item three is Prestwick Airport. We're going to hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary again, this time on Prestwick Airport. This update was offered by the Cabinet Secretary when she previously gave evidence on the matter in June of this year. So again, can I welcome Nicola Sturgeon, Capital, Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities. Sharon Fairweather again, Director of Finance, and joining us, John Nichols, Director, Aviation, Maritime, Freight and Canals from Transport Scotland of the Scottish Government. Can I also welcome Chick Brody, James Kelly and John Scott, who are attending for this item. Uh, clearly, I will take uh, questions from uh, committee members first, but if you want to catch my eye and come in on the back of a question rather than hold your questions till the end, that would be preferable. Okay, so, um, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make an opening statement, please? Yes, uh, thanks, Convener, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to come back uh, to update the committee. Um, progress continues to be made in the work to return Presswick Airport to profitability. It's going to be a long-term project, which I've always said, but uh, progress is underway. What I want to do today is give the committee an update <coughs> on this work and also an overview of what comes next. Um, as you've said, I'm accompanied today by Sharon Fairweather and John Nichols. Uh, they are, as you've indicated, part of the senior management team at Transport Scotland, but uh, perhaps more uh, pertinently for uh, the work of today, they're also board members of TS Presswick Hold Co Limited, which was the company established for the purposes of the government's acquisition of Presswick. Um, there have been a number of de developments since I last gave evidence to the committee in June. Um, some of those issues are covered in my letter to the committee of the 16th of October, but there are some further updates um, I want to give today in addition to those covered in my letter. Uh, firstly, if I can touch on corporate governance um, and update the committee on the arrangements uh, for this. As I indicated previously, we've established a two-tier board structure uh, with a holding company board which will be responsible for the long-term strategy for developing the airport and obviously give the, the government an important oversight over that strategic uh, development of the airport. And uh, secondly, an operations company board which will empower at management to deliver the strategy and that's a point I will stress it many times uh, no doubt during the course of our discussions the responsibility now for running the airport lies with the management team at the, the airport the airport will be run on a commercial basis at arm's length from the government um, following an open recruitment process I'm able to advise the committee today that I am appointing Andrew Miller as the non-executive chair of TS Presswick Hold Co Limited and also the operating subsidiary. Uh, Andrew has a wealth of experience in business development across the aviation sector amongst many other posts. He is a former Chief Operating Officer of the Global Aviation Business at AIR New Zealand and I will provide uh, the committee with uh, details of Andrew's uh, CV which will uh, give a, an insight into why I think he's an excellent appointment as, as Chair. Uh, his job now will be to work closely with the management team to take forward the proposals in the vision statement, which was published on the 31st of October. Um, it's worth also, and I know this is uh, something that's been of particular interest to John Scott, uh, updating the committee on our arrangements for local authority representation on the whole co board. Um, further to the work we're undertaking with South Ayrshire Council, uh, on the newly created stakeholder groups that will be chaired by the council leader and which will initially focus on supporting the airport spaceport submission. Um, I can advise the committee that uh, we've agreed that membership of the whole Hold Co Board uh, will include the Council's Chief Executive in an advisory, uh, sorry, an observer capacity. Uh, and the Council has also proposed, and I have agreed, that the Hold Co Chair will become a member of the wider stakeholder group. Now, what that will enable is a, a close integration between 
the development of the airport and the wider economic uh, strategy and development of South Ayrshire uh, generally. Uh, the membership of the two boards will now be completed by uh, recruitment to the board of the operating company through an open procedure of a number of non-exec directors. And going forward, the non-exec chair and directors will oversee the operation of the airport. They will support the senior management team to implement the repositioning and provide uh, appropriate and robust corporate governance of all of his activities. And as I've said already, uh, the airport will operate at arm's length from the government. And this new structure helps to reinforce that. Um, moving on to the strategic vision, which was published at the end of October. Um, the document includes plans for investment, business development and uh, the optimum operating structure, which uh, is deemed required to take the airport forward. Um, what's just very briefly highlighting some of the key actions that are detailed in the vision document uh, that have been taken over recent months. Uh, they include investment in infrastructure, adjustments to the cost, the operating cost base of the airport, particularly to, to align that with changes to the winter schedule, improvements to the passenger experience, uh, which have been reflected in uh, passenger surveys, uh, the airport also hosted uh, recently the Scottish re-established Scottish Air Show. Uh, they have delivered new Ayrshire Chamber of Commerce and Industry offices within the terminal um, and secured the long-term future of search and rescue uh, at the airport. Worth also pointing out, and I, I say this with a, with a degree of caution because um, I, I think we've got to uh, take a, a long-term view of these things, but it is worth pointing out that freight tonnage um, is up by 38% in this financial year compared to last financial year. So in an uh, environment that remains very challenging, there are nevertheless some signs of growth um, in aspects of the airport's business. Going forward, the strategic vision builds upon the Stage 2 business plan, which the senior advisor developed. It includes as much of his work as possible without impinging on commercial confidentiality and the airport's ability to operate commercially. And that's a point I will be unapologetic in stressing today. If we expect this airport to operate commercially, and we do, then we have to allow it the space to operate commercially. And that means that a degree of what it is planning in terms of the return to profitability it requires to have that degree of commercial confidentiality. However, recognising that it is... Uh, in receipt of government investment in the form of loan funding right now, it is, in my view, appropriate that I and uh, any successor of mine reports regularly to this committee on progress in turning the airport around. As the strategic vision details, the overall aim is to operate the airport in a safe, cost-effective and efficient manner and to develop and enhance its variety of business interests in order to return it to profitability with the long-term intention of returning it to the private sector. Um, the senior management team uh, is now tasked with delivering the vision statement. They have, in doing that, to take account of the winter 2014-15 uh, schedule and the summer 2015 flight schedules. Uh, they also have to take advantage of new opportunities and obviously for reasons we all understand uh, the spaceport uh, attracts a lot of attention in terms of a new opportunity but there's a whole range of opportunities that have been identified for growth at the airport and it's their responsibility to advance all of them. Um, just finally uh, to touch on uh, a couple of uh, points, route development and air passenger duty and then I'll uh, give a, a brief update on investment before stopping to take questions. On route development, when I last appeared before the committee, I said that we would commission work uh, in two areas, uh, the new EU rules and support to airports and air passenger duty. On route development, we've now reviewed the new aviation guidelines and we are aware of both the constraints and the opportunities they represent. Uh, increasing the number of direct flights from Scotland to international destinations is one of our key objectives and we've had significant success over the last year working with all of our airports uh, to support route development ambitions uh, but there's much work still to be done there to help uh, airlines ensure new routes are sustainable in the long term and help us to fill gaps in our international connectivity. So we will continue uh, as government to uh, help all of our airports in that highly competitive uh, market. 
On air passenger duty, uh, work we published in October showed that cutting APD would lead to an increase in passenger numbers at Scottish airports, and Presswick would benefit from this alongside our other airports. Um, I think one of the biggest things uh, that could be done right now uh, to help route development at Presswick in particular, but at all of our airports generally, is the devolution of APD. Um, I know Scotland's airports support that, uh, as do a number of airlines, and I very much welcome the recent submission that three of our airports uh, published. The aviation industry repeatedly cites APD is one of the major obstacles when it comes to securing new routes uh, as well as maintaining existing routes and we've got to be absolutely firm uh, that getting control of that and being able to do something about that would be very, very beneficial, not just to Presswick but in particular to Presswick as we go forward. Um, last area I want to cover, uh, Convener, is around investment. The picture here hasn't changed since uh, the last update I gave to the committee. Um, we have, uh, to date, advanced a total of £7.5 million pounds in loan funding to Presswick. £4.5 million pounds of that was in uh, financial year 2013-14, £3 million pounds of that uh, so far in 2014-15, and we anticipate providing a further £7 million in 2014-15, but that doesn't change the totals that I um, outlined to the committee at my last appearance. And members will be aware... Uh, and we've just had budget scrutiny that we've included provision for uh, £10 million of loan funding for Presswick in the draft budget for next year. And I would repeat what I said before, all of our investment in Presswick is in the form of loan funding. We require to make a return on that investment for the taxpayer, um, and that will uh, continue to be our objective. Final point I would make on investment is it's worth just to put that into context, remembering, I think you raised this point, convener, at uh, the last meeting. Uh, Presswick Airport is estimated in the last year that we have figures for here to have contributed nearly £50 million a year in gross value added to the Ayrshire economy. Uh, so I guess my final point here is just to remind everybody why we are here. Uh, if the government hadn't acquired Presswick Airport, it would be closed right now. Um, that's the stark reality. We did acquire it because we think it's important to the Ayrshire and the wider Scottish economy. Having done so, we recognise the challenges that we face in turning it around. We think it can be done. But everybody who agrees with us that Presswick is important and that it was not the right thing to do to allow it to close, I think now has to get behind us and, more importantly, get behind the airport in doing the hard work that will be required to make this airport a success. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary. Um, and thank you for um, making available the uh, report, a uh, strategic vision report, as soon as it uh, became available. There's a, a lot to get through um, in this document. Um, you mentioned um, that you want, it is the aim of the government to return it uh, to profitability and to private ownership. And I think that will be welcomed by other airports, especially Glasgow, who um, at any body that I'm at where there are representatives of Glasgow Airport, they always mention um, uh, Prestwick as a, a threat rather than, than anything else, particularly because it's in private ownership. I mean, does the government have a kind of target date of when it would like to um, return it to, to, to private ownership? I'm not um, prepared or, or able to put a date on that at the moment. And, you know, I, I think the most important thing for me to do on all occasions, uh, and, and not least on, on this occasion, is just to be frank with the committee. I believe it can be returned to profit. If the government didn't believe that, we uh, not just wouldn't have acquired it, we couldn't have acquired it in terms of the, the rules, the European state aid rules that we require to operate in. So I believe that can be done. I believe it will be done. Uh, but we have to be patient and we have to recognise there is no quick fix. Uh, the aviation market is not only competitive, it's highly changing, so the, the airport has to have a range of options at its disposal and it has to seek to increase its business and expand its business across the whole range of, of the spectrum of what the airport uh, does. Um, it's going to take time um, and, you know, anybody who, who thinks there is a quick fix, if they want to tell me what they think it is, I'll be very happy to, to hear it. But, you know, 
we need to be patient around all of the things that are in the strategic vision. And if we do that, then I believe it can be returned to profit. And as time passes and as we start to see uh, some of the work that's been done bear fruit, then ministers that are sitting here on a regular basis over the next few years may be able to give a more uh, definite prediction of when that time might be. But at the moment, it's important that we back the airport management in order to uh, do the work that they have to do. Um, one point I would say about Glasgow, I uh, believe Presswick can flourish in the, the market uh, that we, we have. I am a Glasgow MSP. I want Glasgow Airport to flourish. And all I would say is I know how hard all of our airports have to work to win routes and to sustain routes and to win business. Um, and I wouldn't underestimate that for a second. But if you look you know, at some of the successes Glasgow has had and is having, even in the year since we acquired uh, Glasgow Presswick Airport, then I would suggest that Glasgow um, is a very good proposition with or without Presswick. And, you know, the management team there is doing an excellent job in growing uh, that airport. And I think that's important to put on record. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the loan funding that Presswick Airport would get over, um, has already had and will get over the next few years. Um, are these loan funds reducing operating losses um, and is the operation getting on a sounder footing currently and when do you begin think you'll begin to see a return on the loans well the again well, let me take just break that question down in terms of uh, the the loan funding that we're providing that uh, is doing uh, a mixture of things but two things in particular um, enabling the airport to operate, so enabling them to pay the bills in an operational sense that keep them running, but also, and I think I went into some of this in some detail at my last appearance, it, some of this is capital investment to undertake some uh, much-needed capital maintenance at the airport. You know, this is an airport that has been neglected for a long time, both in terms of the fabric of the airport, but also, frankly, in terms of the kind of leadership you know, vision for the airport. So we're trying to bring a lot of that back up to where it should be. Um, there's also some of this funding that is about what, what we've described as capital repositioning. So it's not the capital spend that is absolutely essential to keep the airport running, but capital spend that it is um, considered will help to increase revenues. So making the duty-free area uh, more conducive to people who want to buy things, uh, improving the the, the, the customer desks, things that will help with the other objectives, which is to grow the passengers and grow the, the business at the airport. Now, I think I said last time, the capital investment we think will peak this year and, and next year, and we have set out in next year's budget the £10 million uh, that I spoke about. In terms of when that government support can start to reduce, that is tied up very closely with how successful the management team now is in getting on to reduce the losses at the airport and to, to grow well, grow the, the business in order to reduce the losses. And that is what they are absolutely focused on. In terms of the repayment of the loans, that will flow from uh, our judgment of when the airport starts to, to move back into profit. So a bit like I'm not going to sit here today and give a definitive timescale for when we can... can um, return the airport to, profit, uh, to pri the private sector, nor am I going to give a definitive timescale about when we'll start to see repayment of these loans, because these things are, are tied up. But I would remind the committee that overall we have to make a return on taxpayer investment. So repayment of the loans with that return is an absolutely essential underpinning part of everything that we're doing. OK, thanks. Um, Alex. Uh, one of the great disappointments over the last year was the, for Prestwick anyway, was the announcement that Ryanair were going to begin services from Glasgow. Uh, could you give us an assessment at this point of what impact this will have on Ryanair's plans for future development at Prestwick? And what question mark does that put over the viability of future passenger services? Um, I'm glad you uh, said that it was a disappointment for Prestwick. I think Glasgow would not describe Ryanair's decision here as, uh, as a disappointment. It's uh, obviously a, a very good news story for, for Glasgow. Um, in terms of Ryanair is, is hugely important to Presswick, obviously. Um, 
Ryanair have made very clear they retain an ongoing commitment to Presswick Airport, and I you know, very much welcome that. Uh, I think it's important for members to, uh, just I know members are aware, but to remember that you know, the importance of Ryanair is not just in terms of the passenger services they operate in and out of the airport. Their maintenance and repair uh, facility is, is located at, at Presswick as well, which is, you know, for Ryanair makes Presswick important, but also Ryanair is important for Presswick. Um, I, you know, personally have had uh, discussions with uh, senior management at Ryanair, and I um, believe they are committed to the airport. They've been very clear in return uh, with me that they think APD is the significant constraint on passenger growth um, at Presswick. And if APD uh, was to be removed, then it would change perhaps very substantially uh, their ability to put new routes and new services um, into uh, the airport. So, you know, they've been very, very frank about that. Obviously, there are other issues around, you know, Ryanair as a uh, how Ryanair wants to position itself as a business going forward. Anybody who has travelled Ryanair uh, recently, uh, which I, I have from Presswick, I have to say, um, will know that they are going after more of the business market. Uh, consequently on that, they you know, are locating themselves more at mainstream as opposed to subsidiary airports. So, you know, we don't operate separately from that overall operating environment. But I am satisfied that Ryanair remains committed to Presswick and it's now for the management team to work with them and with other prospective customers to grow that part of the business over a period of time. The Cabinet Secretary spoke at some length earlier and again in her last answer about air passenger duty and its devolution uh, on, and its eventual removal uh, are a subject on which I may even be willing to join her on the barricades uh, at some point in the future. However, could she take the opportunity at this point to explain to us how uh, it is interpreted that the removal of APD would particularly benefit Prestwick Airport, given that if it's abolished in Scotland as a whole, surely the danger is that spare capacity at other airports may be taken up before new services arrive at Prestwick? Just to, to be clear, I, I'm not saying APD will particularly or solely advantage Presswick. Uh, getting rid of APD in Scotland or substantially reducing APD in Scotland would benefit all of our airports. So, you know, that's the, the starting position. But it would benefit Presswick as, as one of those airports. I mean, just, you know, Michael O'Leary um, of Ryanair, I thought, uh, you know, put it quite starkly just uh, last month, uh, we're now in November, uh, where he, he was talking about, uh, you know, the effect in Scotland of scrapping APD, where he was saying they would effectively double in size. They would go from 3.5 million to 7 million passengers in two, year, two years, with 1.5 million more at Edinburgh and a million more between Glasgow and Presswick. Now, when you look at where Presswick is just now, that kind of increase in passenger numbers, even if Glasgow and Edinburgh are benefiting as well, would make a substantial difference to the revenue and the profitability uh, of Presswick Airport. So don't read into what I'm saying that I'm saying APD abolition is somehow uh, a particular benefit for Presswick, uh, but it will benefit Presswick. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And the other side of that is that it is a significant constraint in terms of passenger traffic in what uh, the, the management at the airport are trying to do just now. In her opening statement, the Cabinet Secretary also spoke about route development. Uh, and I and others in the party have suggested for over a number of years now that the reintroduction of the route development fund uh, would be the way to go. Now, you've said about how you wish to support route development. Is the new advice you mentioned earlier, uh, does that rule out any return of the route development fund in a recognisable form? It doesn't enable us to return to the kind of route development fund that was in place uh, before the new rules, as they were then in 2005, came into place. Um, just to uh, up, or remind members of the background to this, uh, the European Union's 2005 aviation guideline, guidelines effectively uh, forced the discontinuation of the Route Development Fund as it was at that time. Um, 
and the aviation guidelines that have been published earlier this year, which update those, don't materially change that situation. Um, however, within those guidelines, while we can't have a, a national route development fund, we can and do work with our airports to support route development. Now, that principally, well, that is done in our Team Scotland approach right now, where we will offer marketing support uh, to new routes, and uh, that can be offered uh, to Presswick, just as it can to other, um, other airports. Because Presswick has below 3 million passengers a year, there is also the possibility of, of more direct help around airport charges. The airport itself is able to offer uh, deals to airlines in terms of airport charges within uh, certain rules. Local authorities are not, uh, op don't operate quite within the same constraints the government does, and I know South Ayrshire Council is looking at some options around route development uh, right now, um, and will no doubt uh, give its own views on that in the fullness of time. So there are things that we do do with our airports, there are things we can do with Presswick, there are things the local authority can do. What we can't do is reinstitute a national route development fund on the, along the lines of the one that previously existed. How effective do you think the coordinated marketing strategy will be in attracting additional routes and services to Prestwick? Um, I think it's got the potential to be effective. I think it's one of the things, you know, without having a go at the previous owners of the airport, it's one of the things that just didn't happen in the way that it should have done. Uh, so having a coordinated marketing strategy which looks at existing routes at the airport and how to get more passengers onto those existing routes, that looks at marketing Presswick and the Ayrshire economy. So part of this uh, marketing approach will be to work with Visit Scotland to market the area as a, a destination of choice. Um, and you know, the third component is uh, actively marketing the airport with airlines in order to encourage over time, with all the caveats around APD that I've uh, inserted there, to look at uh, new routes and new airlines uh, operating out of the airport. So that's the kind of strategy they need to be taking forward, that they haven't been implementing for, well, I don't know how long since they've operated a proper approach like that. Now, it's not going to overnight deliver new routes and new airlines into to that airport. Nobody should be under the illusion that that's going to happen. But that kind of approach over a period of time uh, can start to drive a growth in passenger numbers, which is one of the elements of the, the revenue base of the airport. Not the only one, but one of the elements that we want to see increase. Anyone else got any questions on the back of that? Jig? Uh, just in terms of the, uh, the, the comment that we've made regarding uh, Glasgow. There are actually two elephants in the room, a, bit, a big elephant and a baby elephant. The big elephant is what's going to happen to London and the South East uh, and the investment, not, not just the airport, but the infrastructure around it. And I was down there two weeks ago and they have a problem. Um, but the baby elephant is, is recognising the unique capabilities of Presswick and supporting and getting support from the other airports in Scotland. It's MRO capabilities, uh, the ability to handle big jets. I just wonder, you know, how can we get the overall acceptance of a Scottish aviation strategy which embraces all of the, the airports working together and recognising their capabilities? Firstly, I think we've got to be realistic. Our airports are in competition and you know, we, we have to, to recognise that. That's why the government has to take a, an airport neutral uh, stands when we're offering route development, for example, our marketing approach will be offered to whatever airport wins a particular route, not uh, tied to any particular airport. But yes, there are other things, I'm sure, where we can take a more strategic approach. And I think getting Presswick to be very focused on where it sits in the scheme of things is the first thing to enable that to happen. And again, you know, one of the things that has just been lacking at, at Presswick is that you forget the, where it sits in the overall strategy is its own strategic approach to developing its business. And I said at the last uh, occasion I was here, when you look at the revenue base of the airport, less than half of the revenue comes from direct aviation. Now, I, I will immediately qualify that by saying some of the other half of the revenue you wouldn't get unless you had aviation. So unless you've got passengers, you're not going to have people buying perfume in the duty-free. Uh, so, you know, these are all integrally connected. But, you know, there are other aspects of 
the airport's business. It, some of you know, the facilities at the airport, the runway, the length of the runway, the weather conditions all add up to making this an airport that has... You know, it's it's a, an airport with a diverse range of possibilities. And what we need to get the, the management team focused on is developing all of these. Um, that's why you know, this document does have a range of different options. The last thing Pe Presswick should be doing right now is narrowing its focus because one of its strengths is the diversity of what it can develop. Now, I should say I'm about to um, offer up the management team to you, which they'll love me for, but as well as having ministers here regularly, it's entirely up to the committee, obviously, to decide its own business, but it may be worth getting the management team in. Or, and I know they would welcome the committee if it wanted to make a visit to the airport to see, um, not, not long after the acquisition of the airport, I went down and had a proper, you know, in-depth tour around, which gives you a real insight both into some of the challenges the airport faces, but also some of its opportunities. And I'm sure uh, if the committee was minded to, to do that, the, the management team would welcome it. Probably take you up on um, Right, if we move on to freight, Mark. I've got a question on freight, but if I could just perhaps ask a supplementary just on the um, marketing strategy and attracting additional services. I read in the newspapers that Donald Trump is going to be making an announcement on um, Friday with the chief executive of, of Presswick Airport. I don't know if you're able to comment on um, any additional services that are going to be coming to Presswick um, as a result of that announcement? The very idea that I'm able to sit here and speak for Donald Trump is, uh, is interesting. No, I'm, I'm not able um, today to... I mean, you know, and this underlines the point I'm making. The airport is in charge, so I'm, I'm sure uh, the, any announcements will be greeted uh, with, with interest and then you know, the, the committee can ask whatever follow-up questions from that that it wants, but I'm not able to uh, go into detail about that today. Okay. Um, on, on freight, you'd mentioned that um, freight was up 38% at, at Presswick and um, the vision document certainly puts a lot of focus on the, the, that market and particularly um, uh, in the vision documents it's got an, an ambitious plan to strengthen the airport's position as Scotland's premier cargo airport. Um, even though Freight is up 38%. Are you able to give us any figures on the, the market share in terms of establishing itself as a premier cargo airport, um, given the, the figures seem to be in a steady decline and sort of in recent years was overtaken by Edinburgh? What, what progress is the, the airport I, making to re-establish that market I can share? provide figures. That, there are figures in the vision document around this, but I'm, I'm happy to provide figures about not just uh, Presswick's operation on freight, but as you rightly say, where it fits within uh, the overall market. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. That there has been no aspect of the airport's business, if I can put it as bluntly as this, that over the few years before uh, we acquired it, that has been going in the right direction. Um, and, and freight is included in that. But that said, I think it is still important that over you know, a fairly short period of time, we have seen quite a substantial increase in freight. That has to be maintained. I'm not being complacent about that. But what it starts to demonstrate is that it is possible with the right approach, with the right leadership and the right grip on things to start to grow aspects of, of the business. Um, and I think the ambition that's been set out in the vision document for uh, Presswick's place as the premier uh, freight operator, I think, is is the right one. Now, it will be down to the management team now to achieve that, but I think they're right to set that ambition. Is the, is the management team at Presswick doing anything in particular that you can detail to increase in the number of um, freight services that are coming? They will, they will be, they are, and they will continue to work both with the, the two uh, operators that currently operate uh, from Presswick, which is Cargo Lux and Air France, um, and to grow that business both from them and looking at other possible operators. I think this is where, um, without you know, wanting uh, to close down any questions I'm asked, this is where there is, this is a commercial airport. You know, the, the management team on any given day will be pursuing, investigating, exploring a whole host of commercial opportunities. 
But as with any commercial business, you don't always want to talk about those because your competitors might hear and you know, get in there and, and trump you. So there, there will be, pardon the use of the, <laughs> that particular pun. Um, so you know, we've got to, and yeah, I, I stress this point, you should, and you will, because I, I, I know <laughs> how you do this as a committee, you should hold the government to account in terms of uh, the, the overall progress over a period of time, the trends in all of this, our predictions for when we get that return on taxpayers' investment. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day operation of this airport, that is what is going to matter in turning this around, we have to trust that management team and we have to give them the space and the ability to do that. So I'm not going to sit here and go into great detail about all of the different commercial opportunities they're pursuing, because for me to do so would be undermining their chances of success in that. Adam? I'm going to you a little bit in this area, because obviously the vision document um, uh, doesn't really go into detail on uh, reve revenue generation, generating initiatives, commercial confidentiality, obviously. But um, can you give us a, a broad overview of how Presswick Airport intends to increase um, revenues on the aviation side and then on the commercial side? It intends to do it through a whole range of different ways. Um, it tends to do it through increasing over time its passenger numbers. Um, secondly, through increasing uh, the freight uh, load. Uh, and as we've just been talking about, that is probably at this stage the area of the business where they're having most early success. Um, some of the capital spend that I've been talking about is designed to raise revenues in some of what I would describe, it's probably not the correct terminology, is the kind of subsidiary parts of the, the business. So if whether you've got increased numbers of passengers or just the passengers that they have at the moment, are they maximising the revenue from those passengers for the period they are in the airport? As somebody who a few weeks ago go flew from the airport, I think the answer to that is there's a lot more they could be doing, and that is through the duty-free uh, retail outlet, the food and drink um, offer that's there. So they're looking at that, and some of the capital investment is about to make all of that more attractive and more conducive to raising revenue. Uh, there is work to look at car parking and you know looking at how they maximise within reason obviously the, the revenue from car parking and then wider than that looking at the property portfolio and coming up with a strategic approach to you know we've we've talked about this before there's a lot of land held by the airport and um, some of it will undoubtedly be needed for some of the longer term ambitions around the airport but some of it probably is surplus to requirements can they maximise uh, the value of that so Right across the business, there is a focus going forward on raising incrementally, in some cases, the revenue as well as keeping the costs uh, as low as possible and making sure the costs are not getting out of sync with the passenger numbers, etc. So, you know, that probably is the these things I've spoken about are the immediate short term things that the airport has to do to properly position itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thanks for that um, answer. Can I ask one on a more specific issue? I in the vision document, one of the key success factors for the airport's future is identified as, an, and I quote, our integrated partnership <coughs> approach to business development and marketing should be, ad should be adopted with the airport working cooperatively with the local tourism and aviation related uh, industries. In that context, uh, I don't understand the rationale behind the termination of the leases of two specialist ground handling companies, Greer Aviation, which I visited and I, I know other colleagues have, and Landmark which have been operating successfully at the airport for several years. Um, can, can you give us an, an understanding of the rationale? I, I certainly will do that. Um, 
I'll preface it, though, with what I've just said. This is an operational decision that the airport management has taken. And if we get into a situation where we are second-guessing uh, every operational decision the airport takes, then this airport will not be able to operate successfully as a commercial uh, enterprise. And we have to be very mindful of that. We cannot expect a management team to return an airport to profitability and then tell it what it's allowed and not allowed to do in the interests of moving the airport forward commercially. So the airport management, uh, you're right, these companies, and you know, I pay tribute to both companies for what they have done, but the judgment of the airport management is that they can provide those services to a higher quality by bringing them in-house. They can do that more cost-effectively, which you know, goes to my point about making sure the cost base, the operating cost base of the airport is kept as low as it's feasibly possible to do. And they think it better positions them to grow that part of their business. And the fixed base operations obviously relate to uh, the ground handling. Uh, well, Presbyterian already provides ground handling services itself to uh, scheduled passenger and cargo flights. Uh, these companies uh, provide services to you know, military, corporate jet, ad hoc aviation services. That's a part of the business the management team want to and think they can grow. And they think they are going to be more able to do that if they have those services in-house. They'll be able to deliver them to higher quality, they'll be able to integrate them better with their other services and it will enable them to attract more business. Now, the airport will be held to account in the fullness of time about whether they're right about that, but that's the operational judgment that they're making. And without going into detail around the figures here, they are estimating that that will result in a significant cost saving for them, as well as leading to potentially significant revenue generation. Now, if that's their judgment, as the people charged with running the airport, then I think they have to be trusted to make that judgment and to implement it. Now, the last point I would make on this, because I, in, in relation to the two companies involved, we're talking about uh, people and people's jobs, and that is always hugely important. The airport will require to employ people to carry out those functions in-house, so it is likely that many, if not all, of the numbers that are employed by these companies will continue to be employed by the airport, chippy, uh, all chippy obligations will be adhered to, and obviously the airport is, uh, has its own legal advice in terms of that. But you know, discussions are ongoing there about employment and transfer of employees, and it's important to allow them to, to take place. So I, I understand, uh, of course I understand how both of these companies will feel about this decision, and I have make no criticism of them at all. Um, I know how anxious their employees will feel, and that's why the last bit of my answer there is so important in terms of the discussions around transfer of employment. But whether it's a decision about fixed base operations or a decision in any other part of its business, if we're asking a management team to operate an airport commercially at arm's length from government, then they have to be given the ability to do that and to make the decisions that they deem are going to further our objective of returning this airport to profitability. Okay. Uh, I, <clears throat> thank you for uh, responding with the airport management's rationale, and I certainly look forward to having the airport management in front of us uh, for a future session. I, I think it would only be fair to point out uh, what the, the company's uh, affected view is, and that is that there's no doubt that the airport can handle the technical aspects of the businesses, the businesses they operate, like refueling or looking after um, the uh, crews of private or military people who are coming to the airport. But it's the handling of the customer relationship which these businesses have specialist skills in and these skills are likely to be lost. I know the US-owned company, for example, intends to transfer its operation to another competitor airport. And the senior management in Greer Aviation will not involve itself at, at Presswick. So potentially there's a significant loss of business by taking uh, 
this activity in-house. So in my view, uh, my judgment, which is not the judgment of the airport management, obviously, it's a bad idea. And it also sends the wrong signals to the private sector, potential private sector investors that, uh, um, that an airport management can, uh, can just unilaterally uh, take over the business that they've been operating uh, successfully. So uh, the question I'm going to ask now is, can this decision be revisited? Uh, you mentioned that there's a, a new chairman appointed. Is that not something that uh, it's not, uh, he the, can review? The decision is not going to be revisited by me because it's not my decision and I am not going to get into uh, the, the space of trying to micromanage the operation of the airport. You know, if, if we go down that road, then you know, we will not succeed in mm. turning this airport around and I'm, you know, I'm just going to be pretty hard and robust in my view of that. You've cited to me a perspective on the part of the businesses. These are the businesses offering these services. I, I, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not able to judge whether they're right or wrong. I think it would be surprising, given that they're operating those services right now, that their view wouldn't be that they're best to continue to do it. The airport management have taken a judgment that they can deliver these services to a higher standard and in a way that positions them to win more business. And that is a judgment that they are empowered to make. Uh, you're perfectly free to quiz and query, as I'm sure you have, the airport management about that, and I, you know, I, I, they, they can answer for themselves on that. I suppose just the other point I would make here to, to kind of round off this answer is if, if we'd let this airport close, there'd be no jobs at Presswick Airport. When the airport or in any of these businesses that are working... Uh, in the airport. So that's kind of where we were. Now, having decided that we didn't want to let that airport close, we've acquired it. There is a, a long road ahead in turning it around. We believe it can be done, but that long road is not going to be easy all of the time. And it's going to involve decisions that maybe tough decisions on occasion and decisions that some people disagree with. But if we're going to turn this airport around, we're going to have to have a management team that is empowered and equipped to have a hard focus on the commercial realities and making those decisions. Um, and that's what this that's the kind of space this decision falls into. So I understand the perspective of the businesses. Um, I absolutely understand the anxiety of employees, and you know I, I stress again the importance of ongoing discussions to give those employees uh, the certainty uh, that they deserve, uh, given that it's their jobs uh, we're talking about here. Uh, but I am not going to sit here around a committee table or anywhere else and presume that I am better placed in the airport management to make decisions about fixed base operations and whether they are better delivered in-house or by external companies. Okay. Yeah, I've got Mark, James, Chick and John who want to come in on the back of this. So if the questions could be brief and the answers uh, as brief as possible as well, Cabinet Secretary. Mark, first. Thanks, I, mean, I think I would agree with pretty much all of what Adam has just said. I think I would question the rationale around losing that rental income from, from two companies at the outset and also the potential loss of business as these two companies take their customer list um, elsewhere. I, I think it conflicts slightly, or not slightly, yeah, but it conflicts with the vision document. The, the vision document set out the constraints that Presswick operate under, and one of those things was um, the, the high operating cost base, um, as opposed to, to other airports where Presswick manage a lot of their services in-house, and so that operating cost base um, is higher than in other airports. I think this decision will, will only compound that and increase that operating cost base as well. But... The question that I really wanted to ask was about the contracts that these companies currently have. They were competitive tenders and they were won against in direct competition um, with the company that Presswick owned themselves and ask you if you're confident that Presswick and in effect the, the taxpayer isn't going to be liable for um, any legal action as a result of um, anti-competition law where a company who's lost out on a, in a competitive tender and exercise um, takes over a contract as a result of terminating someone's property rights. 
Well, I, I mean, firstly, in, in relation to this, I'm assuming uh, the member is aware of, of the changed legal environment around this as covers pre Presswick in terms of European law. Perhaps yeah, well, I'll, I'll maybe just... Because when these third parties were brought in, uh, the uh, business at Presswick was covered by the EU Ground Handling Directive, um, which uh, was because of its, at that time, volumes of passenger and cargo uh, freight. Uh, so that directive requires an open market um, at, at airports for ground handling services. Uh, so it, it wasn't possible for Presswick to have all of that operating in-house because that directive applied. But that directive um, applies uh, to airports that have above 2 million passengers or uh, 50,000 tonnes of freight per annum. And Presswick is now below, unfortunately, now below those thresholds, so that directive doesn't apply. So that opens uh, a different approach to Presswick. Uh, now, in terms of your point, so that's the legal environment that, you know, presumably people are aware of. The contractual points, you know, Presswick, the management team have to satisfy themselves there operating on a sound legal basis in terms of contracts and they have uh, given notice to terminate these contracts in terms of the contractual arrangements that apply um, and you know thirdly I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying you think the, the judgment is wrong I, I am not going to sit here as a, a politician and presume that I have that degree of aviation uh, knowledge to look at an airport management in the eye and say you're getting it wrong. You're telling me that your cost base is going to be improved by uh, taking this in-house, integrating it with the service you've got for your uh, scheduled passenger and cargo services and that you have an ability to deliver a better service. I, I don't have the expertise to say you're wrong about that. The airport will be judged on whether what they're saying is right in terms of whether it enables them to reduce their costs and grow the business. But if that's the judgment they've made from the perspective of the people running the airport, then I think they have to be trusted to make that judgment. Um, and it would be a strange operating environment for any commercial entity to have a politician uh, telling them that they've got to take a, a different decision. Okay, I have a specific question about revenue overview, but linked to that, uh, I'd just like to cover the, the, the issue of profitability. Uh, when the government took over the airport, the losses were running at 800,000 a month. Uh, what is the current position? The accounts uh, for 2013-14 will be published um, very shortly, actually. The board, I think, will sign these accounts off in the, the next wee while. Um, but the annual loss uh, for 2013-14 uh, will be in the region of £5 million. Uh, now, that's not an absolute figure, that's a, a broad figure, the, the uh, accurate and specific figure will be in the accounts and you can study the accounts uh, when they're, they're published, so uh, you can take from that the, 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 the monthly uh, loss. The airport's running at a loss, uh, you know, the revenue support that we're providing through loan funding is commensurate with that kind of scale uh, of loss, so uh, the focus now is to try to reduce those losses and move the airport into profitability. Okay, the figures you've provided obviously indicate that the airport is continuing to run at a loss of at least £800,000. So that then means that you know, there's got to be a strong focus on uh, increasing revenue. In terms of the vision document, uh, page 27 of the vision document deals with a revenue overview. Uh, can I ask why there's not any financial data or financial analysis included in that revenue well, overview? Within the, the bounds of the commercial confidentiality that the airport has to operate in, I'm happy to provide any additional information to the committee that the committee wants to request. Now, it may be the committee requests information that for the reasons I've set out, I can't provide. But I'm not in the business here of trying to, uh, in any way, cover up the scale of the challenge we've got here. Um, but, you know, I come back to a central point, I suppose, and that is we took the decision to acquire this airport because we thought it was wrong to let the airport close. Now, if people think that was the wrong decision, 
That's a legitimate point of view. I, I don't agree with it, but it's a legitimate point of view. But I think if people think that it's wrong to have acquired it and it's wrong to be supporting it while we try to take it back to profitability, I think people should have the courage to say that and say it up front. And if that's not their position, then you've got to get behind the airport now as we try to do this job. It's going to be hard. It's a long slog. It's going to have its ups. It's going to have its downs. But I think we can get there. But we cannot constrain the airport, either by second-guessing the operational decisions they're taking or forcing them to put into the public domain information that their competitor airports wouldn't. So I will provide whatever information to the committee. If you want to tell me you know, the range of information you want that you don't think is currently available, I will look at that, and if it's possible to provide it, we will provide it. Do, do you not accept but that in order to get right behind the case for the airport, you're making an, a substantial uh, investment of public funds of over £20 million, pounds, but, and you've put great uh, stay by this vision document, but when you actually look at it, there's no financial data, no financial analysis. Do you not accept that if public funds are being invested in the airport, that the politicians and the taxpayers have a right to more information than simple headlines as to what the, the main revenue streams are? We, we require at, at the outset, no, I, I believe what the public want to know is that we have a management team in place at the airport that is focused on doing the things that require to... Now, Going back to the first uh, question the convener asked me, I think as we move through the period ahead, as these actions are implemented by the airport and as they start to bear fruit or the ones, ones don't bear fruit, then that degree of information that we can share about our projections or the airport's projections about when it can come back to profitability become more developed and potentially more detailed. Uh, but you know, right now, I, I, my judgment of public opinion around Presswick is that they want the airport to remain open. Uh, they want to see a return on taxpayer investment, but they want now the airport management to be able to get on with the job that will return it to profitability. Um, I, I don't know anymore whether you actually agree that we're doing the right thing in trying to save Presswick or whether you think it's the wrong decision. All I'm saying is if you think it's the wrong decision, that's fine. We can have an honest disagreement about that, but at least make it clear that's your position, that you think we shouldn't have rescued the airport. Final point, convener. I made clear at the start of the process, process that I supported the government in, take, in, taking, in, in taking the, the airport over. What I'm, what I'm saying now is that um, you've indicated this morning that the losses are continuing at least at the, at the level that when you took the airport over. Substantial money is being invested. We want to get behind that initiative to save the airport and to save the jobs. But, you know, it's difficult to understand how it's been taken forward when you produce a document which lacks detail and has no financial data or financial analysis to back up your case. I, I said at the outset... Of Going course, but I think it's again. important that the vision document is, is the strategy for taking the airport forward. I referred in, I think, my first answer to you, it might be my answer to Mark Griffin, that in a fairly short period of time, the annual accounts of the airport are going to be published, which will give you know, very detailed information about the financial position across the whole range of, of the airports. The idea that this information is not going to be available for people to scrutinise is just simply not the case. Now, I would also say, I, in, in the interest of trying to build a bit of consensus between us, I think you're absolutely right. People... Uh, parliamentarians in particular, there's public investment involved here, want to know in detail what the airport management is going to be doing. I, I repeat, get down there, speak to them. I've, you know, I'm not going to name names, but there are a number of people around this table who on a regular basis make very constructive suggestions to me that then are passed to the airport management for things that they could be looking at doing. Now, not all of them, and the people involved will know this, not all of them prove to be possible to be taken forward. They don't come to fruition. But there's lots of people around this table who are actively engaged at that level of detail. So if you've got things you want to take directly to the airport management, do it. If you want things to bring things to me, do it. Get in about the annual accounts when they're published. And if you've got questions off the back of that, fine. Uh, that is all part of your responsibility as a parliamentarian. All I'm saying is, 
You know, it's easy to say you're behind this until it comes to the difficult decisions. So if we are all behind this, we all really need to be behind it and we need to accept it's not going to be easy. And if all of us can try on this issue, perhaps even if on no other issue, to put the short-term party political bickering to one side and accept that we're trying to save an important strategic asset of the country and we're just all going to get behind it and try and support the airport management as it does it, then I think that would be better than the attempts perhaps to that we can all be guilty of, of scoring political points around it. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned about the politicians are getting all so I'll take my political hat off, put my business hat on. Uh, in terms of, if I were the Chairman, Andrew Miller, the new uh, Chairman, I'd be very upset to say, here's the business plan, you better go out and achieve it. He clearly has to lead, uh, and hopefully we will see, once the strategic document has been absorbed, uh, see the business plan that goes along with that, which will include you know, all of the financials and funding, etc. Can I just very briefly on the, on, on the two companies? I had a conversation, in fact, I had a letter uh, which was distributed to everyone uh, about the, the two companies uh, uh, that were asked to, to terminate the, 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 the business with the airport. I spoke to Greer Aviation. I immediately then went to speak to the airport management to understand the rationale behind the decision. They didn't handle it well uh, in terms of how they, they, they disseminated the information. But clearly from seeing information and going through it, that, uh, and on the basis that they didn't indicate they would transfer, to be considerations being uh, uh, taken on board, that there would be jobs for some of the people. But clearly, what, at the back of all this, uh, which we've probably lost, and certainly lost in Presswick over the last few years, is the customer-centric approach to this. And as far as I'm concerned, a light went on as soon as I, uh, I realised that uh, the airport management, in my view, had made the right decision uh, and and uh, there are consequences, there will be more consequences like this, but I think, you know, uh, running to newspapers rather than running to airport management and discussing it and, and looking at the logic of it is rather unfortunate. But this time, you know, I believe the airport management made the right decision. OK. Uh, John? Thank you, uh, convener. And can I preface my remarks by saying I welcome the government's continuing commitment uh, to Presswick Airport and I also very much note what she says that um, I take the point that if the airport had indeed closed there would have been a loss to the Ayrshire and the wider Scotland economy of around £50 million. Um, I would however absolutely identify myself with Adam Ingram's remarks about Greer Aviation and I don't wish it's not my nature really to be difficult over this, um, Deputy First Minister, but there is a point of principle here about Greer Aviation and Landmark, and they have been uh, reasonably and successfully uh, providing uh, uh, an income stream. Uh, I can't disclose the figures, and that would not be reasonable of me to do so, but I know they are providing a good and proper income stream to the airport month in, month out, and have been doing so for the last 15 years. And I also think that the, the philosophical point is that if you are intending, uh, we are intending to encourage uh, new business development at the airport, uh, and the airport now in this set of circumstances see their way forward as removing the competition to allow them a clear field to compete for this business, um, I, do, I think that will discourage other small businesses from starting up at Presswick Airport as they too in future uh, may be evicted uh, from the airport as their business model is copied um, by the airport. And I think that is a philosophical point which certainly, and I very well understand your, your hands-off approach and totally understand that, but I think this is something that the new board is going to have to grapple with very, very quickly uh, and be grateful for your comments on that. I'm not going to repeat everything I've already said about this. I take the point. Um, trust me when I say, you know, I absolutely appreciate where both yourself and Adam are coming from in this. You are, you know, local MSPs here with local businesses affected by this decision. If I was in your shoes, I'm sure I'd be uh, making representations just as strongly as, as you are. So don't, you know, take from what I'm saying any criticism of the fact you're making these points as strongly as you are. That's your, your job and, and, and you both do it well. Um, but this is an operational decision. You're right, these businesses um, 
provide an income stream to the airport, but the airport's judgment is that they can increase that income stream by doing it differently, and they have to be entitled to make that judgment. I think where I would echo um, some of your comments and certainly agree that the airport has to uh, be careful this is not the impression it sends, is that it's in any way hostile to business development at the airport, on the contrary. So, yes, you know, I think that's a, a point that would be worth uh, stressing, that they've taken a decision uh, for reasons they consider to be sound. Um, but, you know, in terms of what Chick said and what you've said, if, if there is a perception locally that that decision was not handled well, or if there's a, decision, a perception locally that it sends the wrong message to business, then of course these are things that the, the airport board, and I'm sure the new chair in particular, will want to reflect on. Thank if they're you. not listening to this live, they will certainly be looking at the official report on these deliberations and questioning today. Ed, Jim, did you have a short point on this? Not on this point, but two specific questions just for completeness, convener. And they are in relation to... Uh, maintenance backlog and the radar. Uh, if I could just ask, just before, uh, sorry, if, before we move on to that, can you? Uh, you had a point about the staff involved in these <coughs> companies. Yep. Yeah, the vision talk, uh, document talks about reducing the operating cost base, and staff um, costs make up 50% of that. Can you give an assurance to um, staff that their employment in terms and conditions will be maintained, <coughs> and also? The vision document um, says that there's been a, an adjusted cost base in line with the revised winter passenger programme. Do you know if there have been any changes to staffing levels um, the, as a result of as, that? As with any businesses, there will be changes to staffing profile as the business develops. There have been no uh, redundancies uh, at the airport, if that's what you're, you're asking. Within the, the bounds of what I've said previously about a management operating in a commercial environment, um, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here discussing this right now if the whole objective of the government hadn't been to save jobs at Presswick Airport. We're doing this to protect employment. Uh, that's the whole objective, or a big part of the objective of this, is to protect the jobs of the people who work at the airport. So, you know, it would make no sense if how we then decide to take it forward is undermining that. So the management will have to have the freedom to make decisions around staffing and deployment of staff as they see fit uh, but let's not forget the whole object of this exercise is to protect the jobs that depend on the airport. Okay, Jim, sorry. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, Stories. I had two very specific points just for completeness. And the first relates to the maintenance backlog. Uh, how confident are you that that will be removed within a reasonable timescale? And if I could also ask you about the radar. Um, facility, the capital plan does not include the cost of replacing the existing primary radar, and clearly this is of a critical nature. Um, therefore, do you have any information from the management team on how the replacement of that will be financed and what the likely timescale for that work will be? Um, in terms of the first part of your question about backlog maintenance, I mean, the key aim here is for the airport to operate in a safe, effective and efficient manner. So the, the focus of uh, prioritisation of backlog maintenance is with those principles in mind. Um, obviously, Presswick is operating in an evolving market. It's operating to try and work itself back to profitability. So it's going to, uh, beyond that safety uh, requirement, it's going to take decisions on uh, capital works on the basis of work that is projected to improve its overall standing and its overall revenue uh, generation. You know, there will be a long-term requirement for capital investment in the airport. The focus of the investment just now is on those aspects that have fallen most into disrepair that are required to be done for safety reasons, but also required to be done to sort of start to reposition the airport, but you know, I think it would be wrong to suggest that over the next couple of years we'll get to a stage where there's no more capital requirement uh, at the airport. I'm pretty sure no airport uh, operates on on that basis. In terms of uh, the the radar, um, and yes, the replacement of the primary uh, radar is a, a particular issue uh, facing the airport. That's going to be considered as part of the overall program of maintenance and repair. So. Uh, they will factor the investment required 
for that into the, the overall investment, and that will take the priority uh, that they deem it to, to be necessary. But they're also um, looking, and Adam Ingram's uh, familiar with this work, they're looking at whether there's a, a commercial opportunity there so that they can replace the radar. I'm not going to promise to go into all the technicalities of this, but they can replace the radar in a way that might bring additional revenue uh, into the business in a way, for example, that they've done around some of the wind farm mitigation uh, work. So, uh, but overall, that will be part of the general uh, capital maintenance and repair uh, programme of investment. Uh, thank you, Convener. My, my colleague, Gil Patterson, had wished to ask a question, but sad to, to leave for another meeting, and that was about capturing the, what the impact of the government's intervention has been in securing the jobs uh, at Presswick Airport and what the impact to the wider, the positive impact to the wider um, Ayrshire and Scottish economies has been, particularly thinking about the supply chain and what the, the, the number of jobs that are directly dependent on Presley, but also indirectly depend on that facility. We haven't yet done a, a specific exercise to, to assess that. It may be something we should uh, look at doing. Obviously, we can look at as I cited them earlier on, the, the publicly available figures in terms of GVA impact, jobs impact, which shows that, albeit we are investing a significant sum of public money in the form of loan funding, when you put that in the context of the value of the airport to the local economy, then you know, I think that suggests that it's worth doing. Uh, but the point, more general point about assessing and evaluating that on an ongoing basis is one I'm happy to take away and look at how we, we do that. Thank you. John, have you got a question on development and the capital expenditure? Well, uh, development convenient, if I may, um, and the question is um, the one element in the, the document that thus far hasn't been touched on, and I hope I'm not treading on others' toes by asking this question about the, the development of a spaceport. Uh, not with on the other opportunities, um, just specifically okay. on, of course. on ca capital expenditure on the airport or anything. No? Okay. Um, right. We'll move on to the other opportunities like the UK spaceport, the rail station, land and property portfolio and the airshow, etc. Adam, do you want to kick <clears> off on this? Yes. I think John uh, is raising uh, a very <laughs> exciting prospect of Presswick being the, um, the base for uh, the UK's spaceports, which I understand should be open by 2018. I also understand there are um, the basic uh, the bidders have to uh, uh, the competition is basically will be determined by early 2015, and uh, there are eight sites in total, six of them in Scotland. My question to you is: uh, Should Scottish government's position not be that uh, Presswick Airport is the preferred? bid of the Scottish Government for the location of the first UK the, spaceport. There was a murmur of approval from the Ayrshire MSPs <laughs> around the table when you said that. Um, look, there, there are eight sites that have been long-listed would be the, the correct way of describing that at the moment. Six of them are in Scotland. Now, the Government's principal uh, objective is to see it come to Scotland. Um, and I think at this stage of, of the bidding, I think we have to retain a more of a neutral uh, position between uh, the locations till we see what bids develop. And if, you know, at a, a future date, there is one of those bids that is clearly, uh, not all of them, all of these locations may bid at all, but, you know, if there is one that is clearly ahead of that, then that's obviously a decision we will take at that time. Suffice to say, I think Presswick is in a very good position here and will be able to put in a very strong bid. But at this stage, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for the government to have a preferred uh, option at this stage. Okay. I'll just take one then. Anybody else got a question on the spaceport? Uh, John and then Chick. Um, could I just endorse everything that Adam has said unsurprisingly and, um, and say that this is the one <coughs> truly visionary element of, of the document um, and I therefore welcome it. Now, the document, I have to say, is a little anodyne, and whether it is anodyne simply because of commercial confidentiality, um, because I have huge respect for you, Deputy First Minister, I'm prepared to believe that. But this is the one truly visionary element in this document, and I think as the location of choice, and self-evidently from 
uh, the evidence I've seen, it is the location of choice uh, in Scotland. Uh, we should uh, all get behind it. Uh, and I, well, I, I mean all of us as politicians, but particularly the Scottish Government, because that would uh, carry a, a much more weight. The other point I would make, though, notwithstanding, if indeed we are unsuccessful um, in this regard in terms of uh, attracting the support of the Scottish Government or indeed the UK Government for this being the location of choice for this uh, venture, <laughs> what would the plan be? What would the contingency be for Prestwick? if this does not appear for Prestwick. I suppose if I've spent most of this year answering questions about Plan B, I thought I'd got beyond that. <laughs> um, look, I, you know, I think in terms of the last part of your question, um, you know, the, the vision document sets out the range of opportunities that the airport has. The spaceport, I think in the words of uh, those who wrote the vision document, is that it would be transformational. Uh, and it would be. And, but if, for whatever reason, it doesn't happen, then it doesn't change the reality around the other things the airport has to do. So it's not about a plan B. Uh, this is not plan A and plan B. This is a, a plan with lots of different potential components, all of which have to be pursued and advanced for as long as they can be. Um, so in terms of you know, anodyne and commercial confidentiality, I, Put commercial confidentiality to one side. Common sense would tell you that any potential location at this stage before bids have been submitted that set out the detail of its bid in public would be probably undermining its own case. So what I would say to anybody in the committee, the committee collectively, particularly to the Ayrshire MSPs, as I'm sure you will, is get in there and talk to the airport directly about its bid um, because I know that it is intending to submit a very strong bid for this and Again, with all the uh, words I've already said about government neutrality at this stage, um, I think they've got every reason to feel very positive about going forward on this front. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Just, just on that, I respect the government's neutrality. It has to be given uh, the interest of Stornoway and the other Scottish airports. However, I asked the question of the Chief Executive of Visit Scotland, and apart from a, a sort of side comment about the need for visas going forward it clearly has implications and asked what his involvement or the organisation's involvement had been in, in, in the plan which you know, I've discussed several times with those involved in it. Um, Newquay and Cornwall have set up a team from their major agencies. Now it has some major disadvantages but I understand that they've been across to NASA and Houston and what have you. Uh, would it be possible to ensure and secure a task force of the, the, the strategic forum of, of the enterprise agencies, Visit Scotland, Transport Scotland, so that they can support the bid, wherever it comes from? Clearly, we hope it's Presswick, but uh, would that not be possible? We want to make sure, absolutely, that we're doing everything to secure Scotland as a winner of this bid, whatever in Scotland that may end up being. Um, I would also, just in terms of press, we could, of course, point to the work the local council is doing through its stakeholder groups. The first um, priority it set is to support the airport as much as possible in terms of its spaceport bid. So I think there's an opportunity to bring in some of that other expertise through the work the council is doing. Um, you know, we may well get to a stage where the government is not neutral, that not all of the locations bid or there's clearly an outstanding bid but we're at an early stage of, of this process so I think it's important that we, we recognise that. Uh, I, mm -hmm. yeah. but I, I think there is something missing in terms of I think if, you know, an all-on attack. And, and, and I think if you, if, you, if, you, if you listen to me carefully which I think you always do I think you always do um, then you'll hear I'm, I'm agreeing with you which I obviously always do. <laughs> sorry, did I cut you off, John Scott, or did you have something else to say in this? No, it's all right. Okay. No, no. Right, um, if we move on to the assets, the land and portfolio, property portfolio, Adam. Um, do you have any more detail on the plans to exploit the airport's land and property portfolio, Cabinet Secretary? Although, I dare say we can read into the fact that the press conference that Mark Griffin mentioned is actually going to be held in the 
747 hangar on, on Friday with Mr. Trump and the airport management that that might be um, indicative of uh, developments in this area? Or am I wrong? <laughs> Time will tell, Adam. <laughs> Time will tell. Um, in terms of your, the part of your question I'm going to answer, um, I don't have any more detail. The, the airport has to look strategically across its land holdings. You know, some of its land will be important if certain other developments come to fruition, Spaceport being one of those. Other bits of the land holdings around the airport, it's probably difficult to see where they fit in in any kind of reasonable overview of the strategic development of the airport. But the airport has to you know, come to those decisions in, um, in its own way. Um, and you know, I know that it's, as one of the, the things it's investigating just now, it's looking very carefully at making sure... That, and the key thing here is putting into place something, again, which hasn't existed, which is a strategic plan for land management. Uh, so that they, if they're holding on to land, they know why that is. If they want to get rid of land, they know why that is, and they're trying to maximise value from it. Fine. And uh, are there any other um, revenue-raising opportunities likely to produce significant returns? You did mention the air show, um, which successfully returned to Presswick. Um, the railway station is obviously a, an investment opportunity. The railway station obviously is an important part of, of this picture. I mean, it's, it's one of the big selling points for the airport. Um, it needs substantial uh, capital investment. It would, it's not included in the investment uh, that I've talked about already because how real uh, investments are funded is, is different. I think we covered that the last time. No decisions have been taken around the railway station yet. It's part of the ongoing discussions about the investment priorities, how that might be delivered um, and what time scale uh, that that would uh, take place over. In terms of the other revenue, I mean, the airport here has to have a kind of entrepreneurial outlook to this. Now, the air show was a success this year. I remember going to the air show at Presswick Airport when I was wee. Um, so it's, from that point of view, it was nice to see it come back. Um, the gumball, is that what it was called? Uh, which I'm not going to tell you what it is, but another major event that the airport played part of. These are all really important. They're not, these events in and of themselves are not going to turn the airport around, but it comes back to this point. The airport has to do everything, even the small things, if they're part of the bigger picture, are going to make a difference. So all of these things are important, and bringing it all together in a strategic future for this airport is what is, is most important of all. John and anybody else got anything on the other opportunities? Thank you. And just to go back to the strategic um, importance of the airport, I would just um, wish to remind the Cabinet Secretary of the strategic importance in terms of defence, in terms of other airport users and international uh, the strategic uh, security elements. And I know I labour the, this point constantly, but I don't think it can be overemphasised the strategic importance of Prestwick to um, UK and European defence, and particularly... Uh, given the, the level of activity in the, the North East, North Sea and the Baltic. Um, could I just um, also ask, I wanted to ask this question earlier, if you, with your permission, convener, if you'll forgive me, uh, about loan funding. Um, and you said that it was, of course, a, a commercial basis. And the one question that wasn't asked was, is there a ceiling do you have a figure in your head at, at which point the loan funding will stop, um, given the underlying asset base of um, of the airport? Should we know? There is not. If I was to sit here and say we'll get to X million, and then you know that's not going to give the airport a very certain position. But the, equally, it's not a free for all because. The principle we operate under is what I've spoken about before, the market economy investor principle, which is the state aid uh, rules. And that means we have to judge that any investment, at whatever level it ends up being, can generate a return, a long-term return on taxpayers' investment. So I, I suppose the, the discipline and restraint on government is if, if we ever get to a position where we think we cannot do that, that's where we would have to... You know, look, look again 
at, at this. That's, so it's not a case of there is you know, only so much. It's can you, at whatever level it rests at, generate that return on uh, the investment we're making? So that's what we have to continue I to suppose assess. I'm a bit seeking your reassurance that we're nowhere near that at the moment. We couldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't think we could generate yes. a return because we wouldn't then meet the requirements that the state aid regulations set out. Thank you. Okay, if we move on to corporate governments, you've got a small question, Mary. Because the, the Cabinet Secretary, in your opening remarks, you actually answered a lot of the questions I was going to ask you about um, corporate governance, because your explanation around the setup of the board, the way the boards would operate, they would operate at arm's length from, um, from the government, whole co-chair be part of the stakeholder group, was all um, very helpful. But I suppose, given the, the public funding for the airport, I would be keen to hear from you what role Scottish ministers are going to play in the development and the management um, of the airport going forward. And secondly, will there be any review of the operation of the boards and how they operate and who would do that and how will it be done? Well, the need to, notwithstanding everything I've said about mm. the operational independence of the management team, the need to make sure that ministers on behalf of parliament, on behalf of the taxpayers, have an oversight of the strategic direction of the airport and been able to make sure we are satisfying uh, the, the requirements we have to satisfy. That's why we're putting in place the two-tier board. Normally with a company you'd have one board. I don't think it would be appropriate to have ministers, not, not directly, or officials of Transport Scotland in an operational board trying to second-guess the operational decisions. That's why we have uh, opted to have a strategic board over that in which Transport Minister's interest through Transport Scotland will be represented so that we have that proper strategic overview of where the airport is going without interfering on a day-to-day -day basis with the operational decisions. And the chair, whose identity I've announced today, will chair both of those boards, uh, which gives that the overall uh, coherence. Okay. And are there any plans then to, to, to review Sorry, how, how that operates going I mean, forward? We'll, obviously... We'll keep that in, you know, under ongoing review. I mean, we at a much earlier stage of this, um, I, I think, kind of indicated that our preference was to look at having an outside operating company come in to run the airport. Um, now, in the course of the deliberations and the discussions, we took a decision that that probably wasn't the right thing to do because it wouldn't necessarily, you know, if, if you have an operating company come in, you've effectively got a fixed price contract. It wouldn't necessarily allow us to have the incentives on the management team to do what we need them to do. That's something obviously we'll want to keep under review. And as we look over time at the performance of the airport, then clearly the performance of the management team and how the management team is structured, but also the governance arrangements have to come into the equation. Are we getting this right or are there different things we have to do? Ministers will have to, you know, ultimately, ultimately we're responsible to you and to Parliament for the uh, use of, of taxpayers' funds. So we are always, you know, uh, going to, you know, be in the position of answering questions to Parliament about whether we're taking the right decisions around the strategic framework or not. And as time passes, the performance of the airport will tell us whether we're getting these things right or whether we need to do things differently. Yeah. And of course, Audit Scotland are publishing the report. Audit Scotland are also, of, year. of course, um, currently uh, undertaking um, and in doing a report into the acquisition uh, of the airport. And as with any issue that uh, involves public funds, Audit Scotland will no doubt have a, an ongoing uh, role to play in, in reporting to Parliament and, and reporting to the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's a good point to end on. Uh, anybody else got any questions? No? Cabinet Secretary? No? Thank okay, you. can I thank your officials uh, very much um, for their presence here today and Cabinet Secretary, I am very conscious that this is your last appearance uh, as Cabinet Secretary for in this capacity. 
Uh, as, uh, in, yes, in this capacity, uh, can I thank you very much. You've always been very uh, honest and open and transparent and very helpful in your answers. And I'm sure you, my colleagues will join me in wishing you all the best as you go thank on you. to greater things. Well, thank you. And can I thank the committee? It's been uh, a pleasure to work with you and I've always found it a, a very constructive relationship, which I hope, albeit in another capacity, will continue into the future. Okay. Can I uh, close this open part of the meeting and move into private session?